And here your top stories. Global equities and bonds drop after two surprise rate hikes this week. Serve notice the inflation fight is not over. Traders boost bets on a July increase by the Fed. Rishi Sunak goes on an American charm offensive ahead of his meeting with President Biden as he looks to strengthen economic ties with the US. Plus, Lionel Messi turns down $400 million a year from the Saudis. The Argentine football player plans to join David Beckham's US team into Miami. Football mania. I mean, we yeah. say we talk about the markets, but actually all everyone wants to talk about is not only Lionel Messi, but also we go through uh, some of the economics of, of course, what's going on behind uh, footballs. Now, if you look at bond, look, it's all about the bond yields rising today. Stocks are falling. A lot of uh, shifts in terms of what we should be expecting in terms of rate views, and that's really filtering through these markets. Yeah, a real reminder from the Bank of Canada and, of course, the RBA earlier this week that maybe there's a little bit of complacency, or at least there was within these markets, about the trajectory of rate hikes and the stickiness of inflation. So you're seeing that sell-off across bonds. And interestingly, on the U.S. session, you saw a little bit of divergence. The leadership now being taken by the Russell 2000. So for the smaller caps, the Nasdaq giving up some of the gains, what does that portend? Let's check in on the markets then a couple of seconds into this opening. We're weighing up the, the iron ore price as well, which has been ticking up, and the importance, of course, for basic resources and how that plays in to the FTSE 100. So you're currently seeing, what, across the FTSE 100, gains of about a tenth of a percent. Across the benchmark, Europe, losses of close to a two-tenths of a percent so far in the session, a couple of seconds in, of course, after the losses that we saw yesterday. Futures in the U.S. pointed to downside of about two-tenths, four-tenths on the Nasdaq. When it comes to the picture across sectors, let's have a look at how things are breaking down. In terms of assets, we'll talk about sectors shortly, but in terms of the asset classes then, futures again, the new US down by five tenths of a percent on the NASDAQ futures. I'm talking about focused in on what's happening with tech, of course, given the run-up that we've seen in yields. That's take us to the front end, the two-year. And for the context, over the last 30 days, yields up by about 65 basis points at the front end. As markets now start to discuss at least pricing potentially a hike coming through from July, we have that inflation data out next week. Of course, that will be <coughs> consequential for the next steps from this Federal Reserve. 4.58 on the two-year euro dollar 107, just up a tenth of a percent. And there's the iron ore story then. Gains of close to 2% on the pricing there on expectations that there will be more stimulus coming through from China. That's going to play in, of course, to basic resources, and no doubt that's giving a bit of a lift. That's what's playing in to the upside, the very modest upside that you're seeing here in the FTSE 100, just up a tenth of a percent franc. So global bonds, as Tom was saying, slumping after two shock interest rate hikes this week served traders a reality check that central banks are far from done fighting inflation. Let's bring in Bloomberg's market reporter, Valerie Titel. So basically, Valerie, I guess investors are now reassessing the risks of inflation. What does it mean for bonds? Yeah, and reevaluating what this means for the Fed. The two interest rate hikes we've gotten this week from the RBA and then from the Bank of Canada, both a surprise and Fran, both central banks that have paused in their interest rate hiking cycle previously. It was only just back in March the Bank of Canada paused and back in April that the RBA paused. Many people jumping to conclusions that perhaps the Fed is going to regret their pause in June that they have telegraphed so widely. We get the Fed me 
meeting next week. Perhaps they'll shift those dot plots higher, uh, meanwhile keeping that pause in interest rates. But the funny thing for me today was that the move in the Australia front end on the follow through from the Bank of Canada was actually bigger than during their own surprise hike. Two year yields in Canada, or sorry, two year yields in Australia have moved over 15 basis points higher today just on that follow through from the Bank of Canada surprise. And it's following through for other markets as well for the US uh, and, and for Europe so far when we open up this morning. Valerie, how do you tie in the higher yield story then to what's happening with the, the, the Russell 2000 or maybe more importantly for the NASDAQ giving up at least some of those gains in the last in the last few days? That divergence now is quite pronounced between the small caps in the US and that NASDAQ rally. It's pronounced and it's catching a lot of people's eye, Tom. It's just really surprising how much the Russell 2000 has bounced in the last few sessions, almost catching up to the monthly uh, equity rally that we've seen. Now, a lot of this is perhaps a positioning squeeze. Those who felt that they were under positioned in tech stocks, who were trying to catch up on the trade, perhaps position themselves long the NASDAQ and short other indices. And we've seen a, a stop out in that trade recently, the NASDAQ has tumbled near 2 or 3% uh, from its peak, mostly led by those mega cap names. Perhaps that trade is also being a, a washed out, uh, 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 really pushing uh, these uh, small cap gains uh, quite impressively. They've outperformed 3% to the NASDAQ for three sessions in the last week. That's not kind of an outperformance you see often, and it leads me to believe it is a positioning squeeze going on. Yeah, gains of 3% for the Russell 2000 over the last three days. Valerie Titel, thank you for breaking down that story. Let's bring in now Helen Jewell, BlackRock Deputy CIO of Fundamental Equities for EMEA. Helen, great to have you on set. Thank you for joining us. As we said, we have this reminder from the Bank of Canada, from the RBA earlier this week, that maybe the fight against inflation isn't done. It, does it add additional pressure, the rate hikes that came through from those two central banks to the ECB in your space? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me this morning. I mean, the key thing, as you mentioned earlier on, is for us to remember that the fight against inflation is not over. We're seeing this stickiness in inflation, and we're seeing, of course, therefore, concerns from a rate hike perspective. So, so what does it mean for us as fundamental equity investors? Well, two things. Firstly, we have to think about recessionary concerns and whether those recessionary concerns are now more likely and the depth of that recession. Secondly, though, and perhaps more importantly, from a bottoms-up perspective, what does it mean for earnings? We saw a fantastic earnings season, much stronger than expected in Europe, and perhaps that's something we need to have our eye on to really understand the dispersion between those winners and those losers in the market. Helen, fundamentally, nothing's really changed with the inflation picture, apart from these two central banks acting when economists weren't expecting. Is there a bias in the markets that just doesn't want to see where rates will go? I'm not sure that really is the case. I, I do think that from an equities perspective, that the market is very focused on what those earnings numbers really are going to look like. A lot of what we've seen so far, even in those, those large, uh, large equities, has been driven by these earnings. Remember the Q1 earnings season we've just seen, 65% of companies actually beat earnings expectations, which is higher than normal. So you're seeing a resilience in these earnings. However, I think maybe the market did look through inflation perhaps a little bit more than it should have done. So again, this inflation story is really what we expect to see play out as it comes through to the second half of this year. And on earnings, there are those disparities within European earnings. You talk about the overall resilience. How do you exploit some of those disparities? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Of course, something that as equity investors and active equity investors gets us really excited. Because for us, it's about really understanding which of those companies are the ones that can pass through those costs. They've got that strength in the brands. We've seen that, of course, in the luxury goods space. Those companies that have got that brand strength can pass on those costs versus those companies that just don't have that same strength of, of positioning. So it gives us a really good opportunity, and we think that will continue. The market on a whole may be relatively flat. You've already talked and seen that this morning. The earnings numbers may be relatively flat. But I think if you look under the bonnet, what you're really going to see is a significant dispersion and that that is going to come across different industries. It's not going to be very industry specific. But Helen, the last couple of weeks was a bit funny because we saw a company like LVMH, but the industry sector, luxury sector as a whole, really gained on the back of some pretty strong earnings. And then they got sell, sold off on China concerns. Is the, market, you know, is the market fluctuating a little bit too much? Are you expecting much more volatility? I think we have to expect volatility as we see some of these macro concerns that are coming out. We have these little macro concerns on, on a relatively regular basis. 
But as long-term investors, then we think that those earnings numbers are what is absolutely critical. And really understanding in the luxury goods space, that brand strength, those costs, how much they're exposed to labor costs, another number we've really got our eye on, what's going to happen in the labor market as well. Really understanding that from a fundamental bottom-up perspective, not just in luxury goods, but across industrials, across healthcare, some really, really interesting and exciting opportunities out there. Just sticking on the luxury story, because gains are about 20% year to date, but in the last 30 days, as, as a sector in Europe, down about, what, 4% in the, in the last month, how much of your call around luxury is a bet on China and China stimulus? Yeah, I think the key word to use there is as a sector. As a sector, it is down, but again, you are still seeing some of the dispersion uh, between those winners and losers. Now, of course, China is important. It is an important market for any investor. It's an important market for, for us in fundamental equities, but it is only one part of the story in the luxury goods space. It's not the entire story. So yes, of course, something we've got our eye on, something we want to really make sure we understand, but it's by no means the, 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 the entire story that we're looking into. Helen, thank you so much. Terrific analysis. Uh, Helen Dowell there of BlackRock. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets. And Wizz Air saying it will return to profit this year as the peak summer travel season gets underway. We'll also hear from the chief executive. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. safe as it was when you were in the government? It's not as safe as it was. Crime is clearly rising. I mean, it's not back to the dark old days of, you know, pre-Giuliani in the early 90s. But we got to be careful because safety is the foundation of everything. And so I know the current mayor is committed to reducing crime, um, but we're going to have to be incredibly aggressive in making sure that crime does not increase. Are you involved any longer in New York City matters or your advisor? Yeah, the City? mayor and governor actually asked me to co-chair a panel or a task force on reviving the commercial districts throughout the city. So I've been in the middle of that. Studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West. Only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. much diversified our portfolio. We have been extending our geographical footprint. We are not only an airline in Central and Eastern Europe, but we have significant presence in select markets in Western Europe, and we have been rapidly expanding in the East as well, especially in the Middle East. So I think we've got the backbone now uh, for 500 aircraft, and we will follow that mm. plan through in the next seven, eight years. Your confidence in the expansion plan, Josef, what about pricing and consumers' willingness to pay higher prices? I've lost count of the number of people who've, who've told me how expensive their summer holiday is, is going to be this year. Are you confident that consumers will continue to pay these higher prices? I think it depends on the airlines. We are a local carrier, and we are very keen on, uh, on operating uh, the airline at the lowest possible cost. And whatever pricing benefit we can 
uh, put over to the customer, they can, they can enjoy that. Uh, so we remain to be low cost. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if I look at our cost performance, we are coming back to 2019, 2020 level on, on, on cost. And this is important because that basically enables us uh, to put the pricing benefits over to the, cons to the consumers. Maybe not every airline can do that, but that's why people should fly with that. <laughs> You're presenting a, a good story on costs, which is great. Uh, but one thing is, I believe you, you decided to hedge your, your kind of jet fuel much later than many of your competitors last year after it spiked in the wake of the, the Russia invasion of Ukraine. Are you still dealing with the consequences of that? Clearly, the results are good in showing it's not a big thing, but are there lingering consequences? And, and has it changed your decision process around future such episodes about how quickly they will react? Uh, you know, I mean, if I go back a year, we all know that hedging doesn't make money for the, uh, the airline. Hedging makes money for the banks uh, who give the, uh, the, the facility. Having said all of that, I think the learning a lot last year was that we are in a very volatile operating environment. Uh, so this is what one less issue to deal with if you are hedged. And we resumed hedges completely going into the uh, current financial year. But I think that issue is, is clearly uh, behind us by now. We are hedged even more. Uh, and at lower levels uh, than some of our competitors. So we are very confident that th this, this is an issue which no longer represents a competitive disadvantage uh, to be said uh, in the current financial year and beyond. Okay, the CEO of Wizz Air is speaking to Bloomberg earlier. That's a really good question, uh, Francine, whether they low-cost airlines, whether they can call themselves low-cost because prices, ticket prices are really high. Yeah, although you need a second mortgage to actually fly with BA, so... Yeah, I, and second you, mortgages you know, are challenging, every, aren't they? In an environment of 5% uh, interest rates. Everything is rates. relative. Now, the stock for Wizz Air, by the way, is gaining uh, on the back of that. So they, have, they do see themselves now posting a profit. They had losses of about, what, half a billion euros last year. They do see themselves turning a profit fiscal the year by the end of this year. And you're seeing investors rewarding them on the back of that. They saw about 90% capacity, and they're hoping to have about 500 aircraft in the air by 2030. Standard Chartered, flat. There's some stories from reporting from Bloomberg around headcount costs or cuts, I should say, uh, in Singapore, London, and other jurisdictions. Maybe about 100 people uh, losing their jobs at Standard Chartered. So they pursue this $1 billion worth of cost cutting across that lender. Adidas, uh, the big story for us today in terms of sport, of course, is what is happening with Messi moving to Miami. And he will likely get, according to reports, a cut of Adidas profits. It's good news for this company, according to some interpretations, because of their travails around Yeezy. Maybe they can focus a little bit more on expanding in that US market. They've lost a the market share to Nike. But let's see if that turns around with Messi moving to Miami. Adidas in focus. Now six tenths of a percent. Let's bring back in Helen Jewell, though, of BlackRock on the earnings story. Helen, I know you've got a view. We're talking about the airlines, and of course you can't talk about the airlines without talking about energy. Mm -hmm. The energy play in Europe, does it, have, does it have legs? Is there value here now? There's been, there was the story really of 2021, the profits coming through, but it's been lackluster year to date. Yeah, it's been lackluster, but, it, but it's not been down. I think US has been down, but you know, European energy is actually not quite in the, in the same straits. The key thing with the European energy story is the cash flows that they're able to generate. We still see supply demand dynamics playing through there. And these are companies, as you mentioned, which are really, really cash generative. And that is really important for investors. Uh, similar in banks, to be perfectly honest. Mm. Again, some concerns on banks means that it's been playing down in terms of valuations. But these are very high cash generative companies that benefit from interest rate hikes. And that is something that, again, we're very, very focused on as investors. So further to go, we think. Um, Ellen, you also talk about AI aftershocks, and I don't know whether we're 20% there in really understanding how it could disrupt business and the companies. Yeah, it is still very early days in really understanding that. And what you often find with these big mega themes is the market overestimates that the short-term impact underestimates the long-term. And on the cost side, the difficulty is really understanding which of those companies are going to be properly disrupted. We've seen a little bit in education. It's really difficult for us to understand completely how that's going to play out. So at the moment, it's been very much focused on those companies that are basically benefiting from being part of the entire rebuild of these big data centers. Of course, we've seen these really significant price moves. I think that will continue a little bit, but what we're again really focused on is the long-term story in AI. It's one that's going to, uh, excuse the pun, run and run for, for quite some time, is that, I think. Is that story going to be more pronounced in the US, given, given the waiting to tech, or do we look to the ASMLs of Europe 
for the potential upside here. I mean, definitely, of course, you've got those large companies in the US, but the European companies, there's some really, really good European companies that really are able to, to play into the AI theme. And I think people often have forgotten that. You know, Europe has been forgotten a little bit in the whole US story we've seen over the last 10 years. So absolutely, this is not a US story. This is a global story. Asia stocks as well. There's some interesting names over there. And again, what it's about is really understanding the fundamentals and really understanding where those earnings are going to come through. Uh, what looks cheap right now? So if you understand the fundamentals, is there a part of the market that actually you know, was sold off unnecessarily? Uh, we've talked a little bit about the banks, which I think European banks is something we, we continue to be interested in. But there's not really that same sector or regional bias that we saw earlier on this year. If we'd been talking about this in January, I'd been very much saying that Europe looked cheap. We've seen a bit of a run, of course, in Europe since the start of the year. It's still a, a, an area that we're incredibly interested in. But in terms of the individual sectors, it's more about cross industries. Again, not looking at a particular industry, but instead saying within that industry, industrials, consumer, whatever it might be, who are the winners and who are the losers? Just briefly, in a very top line, but Amir is your beat obviously does 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 Europe can Europe regain that advantage over the US European European stocks or, or, or does does the advantage go to, to, to the US for the second half of the year in terms of your regional preference no we still think Europe has a little bit further to go I mean if you look at that long-term shiller P on average the European market trades around about something like 15 percent lower mm. It's still got a bigger gap than that, in part because of the strength of those earnings that we've seen, uh, and in part because of just other more technical reasons. But I do think that gap will still close a little bit, so we still do have a, a European preference. Helen, thank you so much for joining us. Helen Jewell, a BlackRock a Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Fundamental Equities for EMEA. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Sarah Halls. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Francine. The UK regulators have tightened rules around the marketing of crypto assets, including banning the refer-a-friend bonuses that are popular in the industry. The Financial Conduct Authority is also introducing a 24-hour cooling-off period for first-time crypto investors, bringing the sector into line with other sectors it considers high risk. GameStop shares plunged after it fired its CEO, Matt Furlong, and said Chairman Ryan Cohen will now take on a new executive role. Cohen's responsibilities as executive chairman of the video game chain will include management oversight and capital allocation. The retailer also reported fiscal first quarter sales that fell short of analyst estimates. Amazon reportedly plans to launch an advert-supported tear of its Prime Video streaming service. The Wall Street Journal says discussions have been going on for the past few weeks. Weeks. The report says Amazon is in talks with Warner Brothers and Paramount about adding ad-based tears to their streaming services carried on Prime Video. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Sarah Halls and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Francine. Sarah Halls here in London. Thank you. Coming up, EV car sales are set to more than double by 2026. But how effective are they in the fight to lower global emissions? We discuss the latest BNEF report the reality and a reality check potentially for EVs. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. are facing some tough challenges. Higher living and education costs and wages that aren't keeping up with inflation are making it harder for them to support themselves. And they're relying more on the bank of mom and dad. A new bank rate report shows nearly 70% of parents with kids 18 and older are putting their own finances in danger to help them. About half are dipping into their emergency savings or delaying paying off debt, while 43% drain their retirement funds. So where do you draw the line? There seems to be a generational gap. 
as older parents can't understand why being self-sufficient now is a lot harder than it was for them. Gen Z seems to think on average that 22 is a benchmark for covering the expenses, while baby boomers say their adult children should pay their own way closer to age 20. Either way, it's a family decision. Bankrate suggests having a conversation with your kids and setting a specific dollar amount or time frame for footing the bill. Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, aren't you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed yeah. does potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. Europe. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open. This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the open, everyone. We're 23 minutes into the European trading day. There does seem to be a repricing towards interest rate hikes. So central banks doing more across the world after we had two surprise hikes from central banks, and that's, of course, moving yields and also moving equities. Now, Bloomberg NEF says electric vehicle sales are poised to more than double by 2026. That's the finding of its report out today. The governments and manufacturers still need to do more, though, to eliminate emissions from road transport by the middle of the century. Now, for more... Let's bring in Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, uh, who's been crunching the numbers. Extremely thorough report, <laughs> Ollie. Extremely thorough. Uh, what stood out to you? That's right, Francine. I spent all night reading the 284 <laughs> pages just to bring you the highlights. In very uh, small print. Indeed. By candlelight, no less. Um, and so it's extremely exhaustive. When we deal with topics like this, we know there's a huge transition underway. It's sort of abstract. This really puts some numbers on the scale of what we're dealing with. Let's deal with some of the numbers here. 11 million EV sales last year. By 2026, that will more than double. What will that be driven by? Mostly by China. They're going to hit 50% EVs in their market by 2026. Europe, about 40%. The Nordics, 90% of EVs will be, will be uh, by 2026, which is fairly remarkable. Let's talk about the money here, the thing that we really care about, the possible scenarios less and more aggressive in terms of EV sales for net zero. Cumulatively, we're talking about $9 trillion worth of EV sales by 2030 globally, and that's $57 trillion by 2050. If, however, we go to a more aggressive net zero target, that's close to $9 trillion worth of EV sales globally. It's huge, and it's hugely impactful across the commodity sector. How does that all play out? How do we expect that to play out? That's right. You have the upstream and the sort of downstream here. Something that I'm very interested in and that they've done a great job on this report is, is what does this do for oil demand? What does this do for ro road oil demand? They say that we're very close to peak road oil demand, that is in terms of cars, um, but also trucks. It's going to hang around a little longer for trucks. But it's saying that it's already displaced 1.5 million barrels a day of oil from the market. You know, OPEC just cut a million. This gives you an idea of the sort of long-term trend, but by 2040, we're talking about 20% lower oil demand just down to for uh, road transport. However, let's talk about the upstream. We're not even talking about the rest of the commodity complex. If you guys are thinking about placing long-term investments for the kids, perhaps, maybe manganese is the place to go. We're talking about a 30 times demand for manganese. We're talking about iron, 26, phosphorus, 22, lithium, same story. And this is also where you sort of begin to understand the challenges you have. You need to get this lithium out of the ground. You need to de develop huge capacity, not just for extraction, but also for processing. And this is a, a market that China has dominated, Europe, U.S., trying to scramble to catch up. A perfect birthday present, manganese. <laughs> just, just a ton of manganese That's in the right. box with my, a ribbon. There my retirement go. plan is Happy that, is that rock of lithium on my desk in Berlin <laughs> by 2050, hopefully. There you Oliver go. Crook breaking down that BNAF report for us. Really comprehensive, the report, as is Oliver Crook, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, coming up, we're going to be live from Super Returns three-day conference in Berlin. We're going to be speaking to the chairman of Europe at BC Partners, Johnny Danneberger on the ground. Your markets, European equities down two-tenths of a percent. Yields are up again. The bond sell-off continues, at least on US treasuries, modestly. US futures down by a tenth of a percent on the S&P e -minis. This is Bloomberg.
So as you look back on your career, what would you say is the best investment advice you've ever received? Probably the best investment advice that I never received, but that I've lived my whole life around, is surround yourself with really good people. I thought about it just today, like I do many times, you know, what makes a great investor? A great investment firm is comprised of people who are optimists and pessimists and realists. Because in the intersection of the debates that go across that wide range of personalities is where you find truth. It's part of the reason I'm so focused on freedom of expression. I see it in my own four walls, the, the robust and fulsome debates around how we commit our capital, what defines a good idea, what businesses to build or pursue. That's what drives the success at Citadel. And I've, I've been very fortunate in life to have always had a group of friends who really push me, who make me better. And here, I get to work with 3,500 colleagues who, in their ways, make me better each and every day. And collectively, as a team, we've had the opportunity to have an incredible impact on the financial landscape around the world. The top names at the Fed are on Bloomberg. Right now, if you had to tip the scales, the next move is going to be an increase or a cut. It's pretty heavily weighted to the increase for me. Nobody covers the Fed like Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Open, everyone. 30 minutes into the European trading day, and here are your top stories. Global equities and bonds dropped after two surprise rate hikes this week. Serve noticed that inflation fight is not over. Traders boost bets on a July increase by the Fed. Rishi Sunak goes on an American charm offensive ahead of his meeting with President Biden as he looks to strengthen economic ties with the U.S. Plus, Lionel Messi turns down $400 million a year from the Saudis. The Argentine football player plans to join David Beckham's U.S. team Inter Miami. Tom, you know, inflation freak out is basically changing what bonds are doing. Yeah, shaken out that complacency by the Bank of Canada and, of course, the RBA earlier this week. And European equity markets looking for the next catalyst as well, as they weigh up maybe the implications of that reaction function from those central banks, whether indeed it pressures the likes of the ECB, the Bank of England here in the UK, of course, maybe even the Fed as well, to reassess. And as we said in the headlines, the market's now starting to dabble in the prospects of maybe you get a hike coming through from the Fed in July. Across the benchmark today, then, after the losses of yesterday, you're seeing downside by two-tenths of a percent. The DAX is off by 16 points, trading at 15,943, so back below that 16,000 level. The FTSE 100, below 7,700, that level that is important for many, 7,624 in the FTSE 100, unchanged. Basic resources is something of a support for the FTSE 100 as we switch it over and look at the sectors, because iron ore and the prices around iron ore have been ticking up in recent days, but you're also seeing upside for oil as well. That is around the story, the speculation, that maybe the pressure is getting to the point where it's going to tip those policymakers in Beijing to tipping their hat on stimulus. And Bloomberg Economics actually thinks they may come through with a cut in terms of the benchmark rates coming through as early as mid-June. So we'll see if that plays out, certainly giving some support to basic resources and iron ore prices in the session today. Energy top of the list in terms of your sectors, gaining eight tenths of a percent. Basic resources, there it is, seven tenths of a percent. Most other sectors in the red. There's technology. This is linking, of course, to the yield story. Tech as a sector down 1.5 percent. Has the enthusiasm around AI run its legs? Probably not. Probably more about a yield story. Again, at the front end, the two-year in the U.S., that yield is up in the last 30 days by about 65 basis points. Francie. Now, the conversation, Tom, of course, is shifting when it comes to private markets as well. As big firms get even bigger, a fragile economic backdrop is actually threatening the survival of their smaller counterparts. Now, this dynamic is a key theme at Super Returns, a three-day conference, which is taking place in Berlin. And Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us from there with a guest. Danny, take it away. And I'll be looking at Hi, you. Francine. Thank you so much. That's right. I'm joined now with Nico Stathopoulos, who is the chairman of Europe at BC Partners. Nico, so great to talk to you again this year. We always really look forward to this conversation. But, you know, we did talk 
roughly a year ago, and you said, look, I'm an optimist. Um, a lot has happened in a year. SVB, interest rates are still high. Central banks are still hiking. Are you still an optimist? Well, good morning, first of all, and thank you for having me again, Danny. Um, I'm still cautiously optimistic about the market. The market is stabilizing. Um, inflation is seems to have picked. You see it also in the UK. You see it in Europe. Interest rates remain high, um, but hopefully they're going to stop uh, increasing. Um, I think you, you see the market stabilizing. There's no doubt that we need to um, become more cognizant of the fact that both inflation and interest rates will remain higher for longer. But apart from that, I think uh, the world is adjusting to uh, the new norm and, uh, and things are, are stabilizing. Can, can this industry, though, adjust to that? Because there's been a lot of leverage, a lot of high valuations paid. Can everyone deal with higher for longer? I think they can. Uh, and when I started my career in this industry 25 years ago, it was higher inflation and, it, and we did have higher interest rates. Um, we did go through a period of about um, 10 years or more of more probably abnormal situations with inflation at these levels and interest rates almost at zero. So I think it can adjust. It has seen that it has been proven that we can go through cycles and manage uh, investing and still making uh, good investments through different cycles. Uh, I definitely have heard comments from folks at this conference who kind of maybe are less optimistic and have just said, look, there are funds that are going to fall by the wayside. There will be consolidation in this industry, especially among smaller funds who don't have a niche. What do you think about that? I think there will be a flight to quality. I think the more experienced managers will, will come through and will shine in this, uh, in this environment. Um, I think our job has become a bit harder uh, because we do need to manage our portfolio a bit more. We need to have more active ownership in our portfolio. We need to manage our debt maturities uh, more. We need to manage businesses and focus on operations. Um, but I, I do think that uh, the more experienced managers will um, will differentiate themselves in this market. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it, it is a tough time just in terms of the macro climate, in terms of the consumer. Pronovius, of course, the uh, wedding dress company, that you had to hand back the keys. So when you are dealing with these sort of things, how do you make sure you, you keep that confidence, that you instill that trust among your investors? Ultimately, it will come through to the quality of assets that we own. Um, I think the investors can see whether the portfolio is weathering the storms or not. We've been uh, fortunate, given the asset selection and also our operational focus, really, to have a portfolio which is remaining extremely resilient, mm. despite the macro that we're discussing, despite the interest rates, hikes, and everything else. And this is what the investors see. Investors see how, the, how is your portfolio performing. They look at the macro environment, which is natural, but we're not macro investor, investors, we're micro investors. Mm. We buy companies, we don't buy countries, we don't buy uh, economies, and, and that's what, what they focus on. So if they see the portfolio weathering the storm performing very well, they have that confidence that right. we're buying the right companies and we're making sure that they grow the right way. How, how has the more consumer-focused uh, businesses in your portfolio done? Have you seen any sort of, because this is what everyone's worried about right now, is the consumer finally going to stop spending and cave in? Have you seen any signs of that so far? We have very little um, percent of our portfolio is uh, directly consumer-focused. Mm. We have taken a deliberate view that we don't want to have uh, assets in the portfolio that have direct consumer exposure exactly because consumers have been hit. Uh, no one has been immune. It's obvious that uh, the inflation and the environment has hit also the consumer. It has hit consumer pricing. Um, so we, we haven't seen much impact because we don't have that many uh, portfolio go. companies. In, so that's, uh, a, that's a conscious decision. It is a conscious decision. And it has been a conscious decision, frankly, even pro-COVID, pre-COVID, but certainly post-COVID yeah. as well. There's been a lot of excitement around sports, and maybe it's because right when this conference started, we learned that Liv and PGA were going to merge, so it got everyone talking. Um, in the past, you had bid for media rights, things like Inter Milan. How do you view the opportunity set? Are you still interested in league media rights? Sports uh, has been an industry, as we had discussed in the past, that has been one of the most disruptive. And I think it's, sports is also an industry that not only growing, but it's uh, increasingly opening itself up for institutional capital. Uh, there are certain areas where institutional capital can be more uh, uh, catered to. So um, investing in clubs, for example, I think it's more difficult for an institutional investor because there's more volatility in its cash flows, and we do like predictable cash flows. So it's difficult to have predictability in, in sports. Um, but in, investing in rights, it's potentially more interesting, uh, more stable, 
And we do think, as we look at, for example, the U.S. sports market, that the European market will follow, and you will see that uh, that attraction in, uh, in media rights. So, yes, I think it will be a very interesting space to continue to explore. How, how long will it take to get the European media rights market look more like the U.S.? Because you do see areas of pushback, the Bundesliga being a great example of voting against uh, institutionalizing that. So is this going to be a long process? Could it happen over a couple years? I think it will take a bit longer because the, the, the nature uh, of the European sports uh, market and by the way the fact that Europe is not just one country whereas the US is one country uh, and therefore you have that that um, uh, system that ecosystem of different countries having to manage different um, situations different cultures different interests the clubs have their own interests so it is and that's a Bundesliga is a good example of right. things take longer Right. It, probably a, a good lesson for uh, American funds who are coming in and, and trying to do this. Because I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Really wonderful to talk to you. Uh, and with that, I'll bring it back to you, Tom. That is Nikos Stafopoulos of BC Partners. Great conversation, Danny Berger. Thank you very much indeed on the ground in Berlin. Speaking, of course, to the Europe chairman at BC Partners. Thank you. Coming up, baseball diplomacy from Rishi Sunak, even though his preferred sport is cricket. That's ahead of his meeting with President Biden today. We take a look at the UK Prime Minister's visit. What can he actually achieve? This is Bloomberg. may read made in the USA but the sign on the CEO's door often says made in India Alphabet's Sundar Pichai Microsoft Satya Nadella IBM's Arvind Krishna Micron Technologies Sanjay Mehotra and that's just the start added the chief executives of Adobe Deloitte Gap VMware and that doesn't count Indians running companies all over the world why have so many Indians risen to the top but no Kosla points to India's incredibly competitive education system. If you can survive the pressure it takes to get into one of the Indian institutes of technology, it gives you confidence to handle American universities and later the business world. Meanwhile, the belief in India's ability to produce so many tech wizards is reinforced every year. Indians make up about three-fourths of the immigrants receiving coveted H-1B visas for the U.S. And it's a safe bet that some of them will eventually find their way to the C-suite. politics to the world of business every weekday at 5 p.m eastern time hosts Anne marie hordern and joe matthew alongside kaylee lines deliver news insight and analysis live from bloomberg's washington headquarters get the latest from and about politics biggest power players at the end of every trading day balance of power every weekday at 5 p.m eastern time only on bloomberg your global business authority Markets count down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. Welcome back to the Open, everyone, 42 minutes into the European Trading Day. The focus firmly on some of the surprise hikes, actually, from two central banks. The latest was Bank of Canada, that rate increase is basically leading a lot of traders across the world to reassess the risks of stubborn inflation. So we were seeing a, a change or a repricing in a lot of bond yields and equities for the moment are practically unchanged here in Europe. Now, Rishi Sunak is stateside on his first official visit to the U.S. as U.K. Prime Minister. Now, Sunak wooed U.S. business leaders and politicians 
politicians engaging in baseball diplomacy ahead of his meeting with President Joe Biden today at the White House. Well, joining us now for more is Bloomberg UK correspondent Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, I mean, baseball diplomacy, I didn't even know that this was even a thing, but the, the concern is that actually he needs a deal with the US and they don't want to give it to him. Well, exactly. And a free trade deal isn't even on the table. But Rishi Sunak's main mission, of course, is to shore up economic ties with the US, try to put them on a more even footing with the security relationship. And behind the scenes, officials are calling it a trade deal in all but name. That's what they're after. But as you say, Tom, Rishi Sunak, more of a cricket man than a baseball man, trying to get a home run here when it comes to the economy. <laughs> Very nice, Lizzie. You worked on that one, didn't you? <laughs> AI. Maybe AI is something you can come home with because there is that need for alignment in terms of regulation. Both countries do genuinely have deep expertise and deep talent on this, and this is something he's going to be pushing with Joe Biden. Yeah, he said that the UK's AI sector is third in the world behind the US and China. He announced yesterday that Britain's going to be home to the first global AI summit on AI safety. Uh, and he wants London to be home to a global watchdog for AI regulation. But just as it's been the case with many other issues post-Brexit, Britain's kind of got some fighting to do here. Last month, there was a meeting meeting between US and EU officials in Sweden. Britain wasn't at the table. It was about AI safety and regulation. Uh, so he's going to have to do some persuading at the White House today, also talking about Ukraine and China. OK, we'll also be watching that chemistry, won't we, as well, whether that is genuine in terms of Rishi Sunak when he meets the US president later today. Lizzie Burton, thank you very much indeed, of course, our UK correspondent for the latest as we look ahead to that meeting between the Prime Minister and his US counterpart. Let's get the Bloomberg First Word News now with Sarah Hall. Sarah. Bloomberg has learned that Donald Trump's legal team has been notified the former president is a target in a federal investigation into the handling of classified documents. Prosecutors have been building a case that includes testimony from former aides, including a former chief of staff, Mark Meadows. The Trump says he hasn't been told he's being indicted and has done nothing wrong. The mayor of New York has told residents to stay indoors or wear N95 masks if they go outside a smoke blankets region. This, as wildfires continue to ravage large tracts of forest in Canada, sending smoke more than 1,000 miles southwards. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says it's the worst wildfire season in Canada's recorded history. UK regulators have tightened rules around the marketing of crypto assets, including banning the refer a friend bonuses that are popular in the industry. The Financial Conduct Authority is also introducing a 24-hour cooling-off period for first-time crypto investors, bringing the sector into line with other sectors it considers high risk. The Bank of Canada has surprised with a 25 basis point rate hike, restarting its tightening campaign. Policymakers raised the lending rate to 4.75%, the highest in 22 years. The move ended the pause to hikes declared in January, with the BOC citing an overheating economy. Japan's economy grew more than expected in the first quarter as businesses ramped up spending. Revised data show GDP rose 2.7% annually, up from an initial reading of 1.6%. This indicates that Japan avoided a technical recession at the end of last year. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Sarah Halls, and this is Bloomberg. Tom Francine. Sarah, thank you so much. Sarah Halls here in London. Now, billionaire Ray Dalio says the U.S. is seeing a late big cycle debt crisis as it deals with stubbornly high inflation. Well, he spoke with David Weston at Bloomberg Invest in New York. In my opinion, we are at the beginning of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle debt crisis when the supply demand gap, when you're producing too much debt and you have also a shortage of buyers. What's happening now as we have to sell all this uh, debt is we then have, do you have enough buyers? There are changes now in terms of the quantities in the world that are being held by um, large investors around the world that have lost money in these treasury bonds and so on. And then there are geopolitical changes which are having an effect. Some cases, some countries are worried about sanctions. And then there's this geopolitical shift. So when I look at the supply demand issue, there's a supply demand issue for that debt. There's a lot of debt. It has to be bought, has to have a high enough interest rate. So a crisis, that's you know, if we continue down this path in terms of what, what's likely over the next, you know, five and ten years, 
then you, what you reach the point that that balancing act becomes very difficult. How will we know? And is it really a function of not having enough buyers for the federal debt? Is there any evidence of that so far? Um, we, we're right at the brink of starting to find out that. The amount of selling of government debt um, collapsed, right? We didn't issue government debt. Um, and now we're going to issue a lot of government debt. And so when one looks at, when we look at the buyers, there appears to be a shortage, a significant shortage of the buyers for that government debt. But we're now at the brink of being able to see what that supply demand pa um, picture looks like as we go over the next year and two. <laughs> That, of course, was billionaire Ray Dalio on the U.S. entering a big cycle debt crisis at Bloomberg's Invest in New York event. Coming up, Lionel Messi turns down, Lionel Messi turns down a huge Saudi offer, $400 million, and instead will play for a U.S. team backed by David Beckham. We discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. business or the business you're in? Well, it's hopefully what I've taught my kids. You got to be intellectually curious. You got to be, um, you got to show up. And you know this like I know this. I got on a lot of planes. You just, yeah, you, even though that voice in your head is saying, oh, God, I'm so tired. I don't want to do this. You got to show up. You got to be um, charmingly relentless. You have to build um, emotional endurance because there's no straight line to success. It's kind of all over the place, and you have to just be able to work through those things. Um, and then I think one of the things that I do every week is I try uh, to create serendipity. This is Bling Bang. We are at the beginning of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle, debt crisis. Private credit which was a cottage industry a decade ago, a quarter trillion dollars is now 1.4, 1.5 trillion. And a lot of those companies are going to suffer under the weight of those interest payments. I think there is a, a true reset in value in, uh, in real estate. And now is a great time uh, to be with an active manager in real estate and not buying the index for sure. I think the next big opportunity is in women's sports. Women's soccer should go from 50 million to 500 million. The United States has to be the beacon of stability, strength in the world. And at times when this discussion's going on and you travel the world, everybody gets fixated on it because the United States is the benchmark of the benchmarks. And if it goes completely somehow accidentally, it's a real problem. The most important thing, I think, is how we take care of ourselves. Can we get strong? Can we raise productivity? Can we be politically and economically cohesive? <clears throat> 
key voices there at the Bloomberg Invest uh, Summit taking place in New York. Now, onto football. Lionel Messi has turned down a huge offer from Saudi Arabia, but it's a score for U.S. club Inter Miami as a football star is set to join them instead. Well, Bloomberg reporter Joe Easton joins us now. He's also a big football fan. This feels very significant, Joe, because of the timing. So we have, the, you know, the golf with the Saudis playing a, a, a big role, and the big question was, were the Saudis able to attract Lionel for the little sum of $400 million a year, and he said no thanks. Yeah, and I think that makes it kind of a bit of a blow for them, given that they were willing to offer that. And also, it's made it high, more high profile than it would have been, because everyone thought that he would either go back to Barcelona or he would go to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and now he's gone to the MLS, so it has made that even bigger deal. And it's also a bigger deal in terms of his age and his performance. He's still 35 He's not in his late 20s, but if we look how he performed in the last World Cup, for example, he's still performing such a high level, and it's shown that the MLS is able to attract players that aren't necessarily sort of on their way out. They're still performing at that top level, so it's a bit of a change there, I think. Do you think it really leads to a turnaround in terms of that, in terms of, in terms of US, US soccer, US football, Miami, Bex has played a role, but it's been a challenge, right? I think that the Beckham deal all those years ago, I think it was 2007 maybe when he first signed the deal, that was a big change for the, for the league. That was yeah. the new thing. And then it's been lots of players have gone over towards the end of their careers. As I say, now this is Messi coming over. It's going to be something that reinvigorates the league. And it is much more significant than the other players they've signed recently. Even somebody like Zlatan Ibrahimovic went there. was a big star, but he was 37. You know, he was knocking into his 40s. Um, and I think that this, this is kind of a bit of a bigger deal in terms of that sense. Joe, I mean, we also have this great story actually looking at some of the money, right, private equity, sovereign wealth funds, and it's today that we see Qatar upping the stake or the money they're willing to offer for United. Yeah, exactly. So the Qataris potentially going to bid for a fifth time, according to our reporters. Um, they're looking to obviously outbid Ineos, Jim Ratcliffe. They want to get the deal done before the transfer window opens. That opens on June 14th. They want to be in control so they can start controlling what deals the clubs do on a transfer perspective. But that story that you mentioned is really interesting. Got some great graphics where you can see where there was virtually no sovereign wealth ownership in the Premier League in the early 2000s, and that's just expanded. And this could potentially expand even more now. Yeah, you're right. It is a great read, and the graphics are fantastic. It's well worth checking out, isn't it? Joe Easton, thank you very much indeed for getting us up to speed with all the changes coming through for the world of football. We look ahead, of course, to what happens with Man U in terms of that bid. Let's take a look now at what the markets are watching today. 10 a.m. UK time, we're going to get the Euro area final GDP reading for the first quarter later on at 1.30 p.m. We're going to get U.S. jobless claims. Also in the U.S., we're going to get wholesale inventories data for April at 3 p.m. And finally, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak continues, as we mentioned, his Washington DC trip where he's hoping to see closer economic ties with the US. He's going to be meeting, of course, with the President Joe Biden. Now, this is a picture across the board. Again, there is quite a lot of news as we have two interest rate uh, hikes from central banks that we weren't expecting. So bond yields globally are actually rising. If you look at technology or some equities uh, in general, so tech shares seem to be bearing the brunt of some of the jitters over some of the uh, higher interest rate expectations. Again, the unexpected decision by Bank of Canada to restart its interest rate hike campaign um, yesterday, which followed an increase earlier in the week in Australia, uh, is basically continuing to reverberate across global markets time. That is it for the European market open surveillance. Early edition is up next. European equities off by a tenth of percent. Futures in the US. Nasdaq futures down three tenths. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
Okay, so you're moving in on me quick, distracting oh, yeah. me with your fancy hands. <laughs> I'm going to deal with your knight because he's really bothering me. Ah, my knights. Yeah, he's a troublemaker. Yeah. What did you get up to this weekend? Uh, you know, just robot stuff. A lot of chess. I was practicing for uh, for you. I know you're pretty good. Ooh, I don't like that. I will take this. Uh, put it over here. Not cool. Not cool. All right. I will. I will concede. I can see. Ah. You got me beat. <laughs> Very good game. Well played. Thank you, sir. Thank you. covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month. Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Global equities slump, government bond yields climb after a second surprise rate hike this week. We discuss market volatility and the role of technology with the world's largest publicly traded hedge fund. Rishi Sunak pushes for closer economic ties with the U.S. ahead of his first visit to the White House as U.K. Prime Minister. We look at the diplomatic challenges and future of free trade with the European Union's former Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier. Plus, Saudi Arabia may have secured a shock merger with professional golf, but the kingdom has missed out on football icon Lionel Messi while well, he's turning down, turning down $400 million a year in favor of David Beckham's club, Inter Miami. So quite a lot going on, and we have a really packed show full of stellar guests. But first thing is first, let's get on to the markets, because there is also a lot going on with the markets. If you look at the surprise Bank of Canada rate increase, leading traders to really reassess the risks for a stubborn inflation. It does mean that, for example, tech shares are bearing a lot of the brunt of the jitters over some of these higher interest rates. And look, to put it very simply, bond yields are rising, and that could continue Going forward, Treasury yields ticking higher after an increase across the curve yesterday that at some point added 14 basis points to the 10-year benchmark. To put it simply, the fact that there was two unexpected decisions to deal with inflation, uh, so Bank of Canada and that followed an earlier increase in the week in Australia, is continuing to reverberate across global markets. So to talk about inflation, the dynamics for some of the specialist tra you know, strategies, and of course what markets are asking. For. I'm delighted now to be joined by Giuliana Bordigoni, Director of Specialist Tra Strategies at Man Group, the world's largest publicly traded hedge fund. So, Giuliana, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, the markets are just a little bit odd, right? They look about inflation, they look at, at a number of things. You're a quant specialist, you're a mathematician by trade. What are clients asking you? Good morning, and thanks for having me here. So, um, I think you're right. I mean, uh, what we have seen in the last uh, year and a half or so, what we have, we have seen uh, a positive correlation between uh, bond and equities, especially on the downside, which meant that the traditional portfolio, 60-40 uh, portfolios, have suffered losses. So, uh, what clients are looking for are looking for uh, diversification from this uh, uh, portfolio, and they're trying to, they are looking at alternatives in general. So they are looking at uh, uh, trend following, which is one of the strategies that have worked uh, across the industry in the last few years. You mentioned inflation. 
well, if you look at uh, when trend following does well, it tends to do well in period of high inflation, and it tends to give a bit of protection during crisis, which is something that uh, in the current uh, moment is fairly topical. So, Juliana, when you look at so the, the inflation, and for me, it's unclear whether the markets understand that, you know, if we're dealing with inflation for longer, it means interest rates are going to be higher for longer, and therefore that changes some of their strategies. What, what do you think is, it, when you look at your markets and some of the specialist strategies, that, you know, investors are not fully understanding right now? So I think that uh, uh, our main uh, point of view is like to diversify away. So right, when you think about inflation, when you talk about interest rates, is one part of our portfolio, yes. right? Uh, we try to tend, I mean, uh, we tend to trade uh, across all asset classes, which means that uh, uh, you will have, uh, if inflation stays high, probably you have like some uh, uh, trends in the commodity space, uh, that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, trends appearing. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of uh, uh, what the, what we have. Yeah. But but is it new trends? So and this I, I find you know quite powerful. Is it trends that were already starting to emerge that have been reinforced, or is it new trends in this new environment that clients are asking for? Well, if you, uh, I think that okay. My point of view on trends is that trends is not for one environment specifically. So when you invest in trend, for me, is you invest in, in trends for the long term. So it's not about uh, uh, when there is a trend, the idea of a trend following system is that yes. you will capture it. Whatever it's a new trend, if it's an appearing trend, and so on. So if you look at this year, where we have seen trends, uh, fixed income has been challenging. Because yes, now we are seeing interest rates rising again. We have seen interest rates rising in uh, uh, January and February. But we have seen also like uh, a very strong uh, uh, rally when uh, on the regional, uh, US regional bank, uh, let's call it crisis, right? So what I mean is that it, uh, like fixed income this year, I wouldn't, <laughs> well, last year it was a strong trend. This year I wouldn't call it the strongest trend we have seen. But we have seen trends in other asset classes, so we have seen trends in some of the effects, yeah. um, both on uh, some emerging market appreciated yeah. and, and in some, uh, and on the other side, on like uh, uh, the dollar appreciating versus some currency like the yen, for example. Um, so, Trina, are you expecting this volatility, this kind of volatility that basically leads to, you know, a, a change in market strategy to continue for a long time? Because markets have, frankly, just, you know, they seem they're all over the place. I, I, I mean, I think that uh, if you ask me what has been the main change in markets, it's been the volatility side. What I mean is that we have seen very, uh, we have seen higher volatility pretty much across the board, and it has been, it is uh, motivated by like uh, uh, inflation, as you say, but sort of fundamental variable. So I do think personally that is going uh, to stay for a while. So I do think that this environment of high volatility is here for a while. There's a buzzword, AI. It touches everything. I mean, I, there's so much excitement about AI, and it kind of came out of, of nowhere. I mean, where, do, where do we end up on AI? What does it mean for market participants? So I think that uh, uh, we have been doing AI for many years. So I mean, I, I started about 15 years ago, and we would start AI. We start doing AI like uh, soon after. So what I mean is that for us is uh, uh, one of. Uh, the uh, models, one of the methodologies that we apply to, to a few markets. So for us, it's not a new thing. Yeah. Clearly, in the last year, there has been uh, the massive disruption that's been created by ChatGPT, so more like generative AI. Uh, how do I see it? I see it like, uh, um, like in terms of the models that are behind that, there is like these, like, uh, language models that clearly they have progressed a lot. And we know that GPT-4 is much better than GPT-3.5, which is telling you like the progress and the development in the models themselves. Now, the main disruption in the last few years is that uh, if in the last 10 years we needed expert to write a machine learning model, now you don't. Now anyone from uh, a computer can just say, I want to write a sentiment indicator, and, it's, uh, uh, and you don't need to know any NLP, uh, what before you did. And so definitely I see uh, some uh, uh, use in NLP, so like writing and sentiment indicators uh, in terms of like signals and so on. But I see it also a massive tool for like learning, like sort of it really is an efficient way of accessing knowledge, it's a nice way of summarizing. And uh, so I think that that is like another way of using it. It might, help, it might be helpful even in idea generation, because it might be easier to find the variables that are driving um, a certain uh, uh, 
uh, company that you might think of. So, Jeanette, so th this is a not hype, right? It will change. Maybe we're expecting too much of it in the shorter term, but you think it, it will change? Does it change the way that quants work or, or the way that, you know, for example, hedge funds use quants and quant models? I think it's going to be more on the quant side because, as I said, quant sort of have been doing it. They do have the expertise. It might make the, the, the job of the quant quicker in the sense that it might be easier to code, it might be easier to access uh, some, uh, uh, some knowledge. I do think it might change more the other side, but I mean the discretionary side, because at that point it might be easier to access uh, sort of quant tools and so on. So I, I see it as a tool. Giuliana, thank you so much for coming on today. Giuliana uh, Bordigoni, the Director of Specialist Strategies at Man Group. Now also coming up, inflation, sustainability and changing consumer trends. Just some of the challenges facing the industry as London Fashion Week kicks off tomorrow. We'll be speaking to Caroline Rush, the Chief Executive of the British Fashion Council. Don't miss that interview. And then after that, we also speak to Michel Barnier of the EU. This is Bloomberg. is as safe as it was when you were in the government? It's not as safe as it was. Crime is clearly rising. I mean, it's not back to the dark old days of, you know, pre-Giuliani in the early 90s. But we got to be careful because safety is the foundation of everything. And so I know the current mayor is committed to reducing crime. Um, but we're going to have to be incredibly aggressive in making sure that crime does not increase. Are you involved any longer in New York City matters or your advisor? Yeah, the City? mayor and governor actually asked me to co-chair a panel or a task force on reviving the commercial districts throughout the city. So I've been in the middle of that. U.S. jobs numbers are released. Bloomberg brings you crucial data at terminal speed and instant expert analysis. Nobody covers jobs day like Bloomberg. Japan's critical role in the global economy is changing as the world recalibrates. After decades of stagnation, Japan's leaders are forging a more innovative and sustainable path forward to revitalize the nation. Corporate giants, policymakers, and pioneers tell us how they're doing just that. Every week on Japan Ahead, right here on Bloomberg Television. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. London Fashion Week kicks off tomorrow as the industry grapples with inflation and changing consumer trends. Now we're joined by Caroline Rush, the Chief Executive Officer of the British Fashion Council. Caroline, thank you so much for joining us. There's a lot to talk about. Because good morning. A huge, good morning. This huh? is a huge industry, of course, for uh, UK PLC. Yeah. And, and they're going through a lot of headwinds. It's, it's cost going up. It's, of course, d doing trade. What, As you speak to a lot of these industry leaders, what do they tell you they're most concerned about? So it's challenging times. It's been a turbulent few years. Um, immediately it was just the cost of doing business and time, paperwork, post-Brexit. And that continues as businesses grapple with it. A lot of people have had to employ extra people that, you know, just warehousings had to move to the EU because it was just getting too expensive and too timely to bring goods in and send them out again. So we've seen that jobs have gone, unfortunately, and have moved to the EU. So there's a definite impact already in terms of um, the industry in the UK. And there's a lot of pain being felt around that. Um, and tax-free shopping, obviously, is front of mind. Rising costs cost of borrowing, you know, all of the things that put extra pressure on businesses. I mean, do, do you lobby the government to try and get tax-free shopping? And if you look at the numbers, yeah. and we heard actually the Burberry chairman really go go after the prime minister and yeah. say, look, it just doesn't make business sense because people are, are, especially Americans, that spend a lot of money on luxury are just going elsewhere to buy it. 
Well, I think everybody's going elsewhere, and I think that's the challenge, is that industry are seeing the real-time numbers, they're seeing the real impact. Um, of course, is that when we were during the pandemic and it was decided that tax-free shopping should go, we, you know, it was muddied by um, the pandemic, but of course is that now tourism's coming back, is that everybody's feeling that impact. And for businesses that have retail in the UK and they have retail in Paris and Madrid and Milan, they can actually see those figures, real-time data. So, you know, is that uh, what we're doing is sharing some of that data with government so that they're understanding the real impact. And it's not just the international tourists that are spending more in Europe. So all EU countries have tax-free shopping. The UK doesn't. Um, but it's the UK consumers. I think one of the businesses said that their shop in Paris was up 200% of UK consumers who are going to Paris to buy their luxury goods and basically getting a free weekend out of it. And what that means is that when you're looking to invest in retail, is that you're going to go where the numbers are. And of course, we want the investment to come to the UK. We want the jobs in the UK. And it has a spill spillover impact in terms of hospitality, in terms of you know, visitor attractions, museum numbers are down. We really need to think about um, addressing this, uh, certainly in the next few months. Yeah, because the whole ecosystem, is it, it really is. Is the Chinese shopper back? Uh, they're starting to come back is that when you look at the numbers, I think um, uh, we're seeing some of that. But of course, is that, that a lot of that tourism, again, is going to the EU. Uh, from a visa perspective, it is easier for them to travel to the EU. So why are we making it difficult? We want the tourism here. We want the spend in the UK. We want the investment from international brands to be part of our high streets to make sure, not just in London, but throughout all of the tourism destinations we have in the UK to make sure that that's thriving. So it's something that needs addressing really quickly. And Carolyn, and you've always, of course, lobbied also for uh, more sustainable. You've always l lobbied, basically, you know, the, the causes of, of the luxury sector yeah. um, to the government. In terms of sustainability, are, are we really making progress, or is it done in such a way that it's become prohibitive? Well, I think is that from an industry government perspective is that the pressures on cost is actually seeing the need to come together and collaborate. So we're quite hopeful around the opportunity of having programs that will look at industrial change within the UK and investment in some of the innovation and some of the infrastructure that's needed to actually get to sort of circularity ecosystems in the UK, which is what, to, you know, that's the utopia. Yes. It's what we're aiming for. Um, but certainly there's legislation coming from the EU. Most of our businesses trade within the EU, so we need to make sure that we are ready to do business with that. And in fact, I was in Brussels yesterday with my European counterparts talking about how um, that kind of legislation isn't just about thinking about compliance for the fast fashion businesses, but we're protecting the creators because a lot of the designers that are taking part in London Fashion Week, you know, the emerging designers that are coming through are sustainable businesses. They're using upcycle, recycle materials, materials that can be repaired, and we want to make sure that we're protecting those businesses and putting the creators front and center. How hard is that, you know, when we're dealing with inflation? Actually, London Fashion Week also starts tomorrow, which is exciting because after a couple of years of COVID, at least it's back um, and in the physical form. It is. So it's really exciting to have London Fashion Week back is that in February we had a, a full-blown Fashion Week of shows. Uh, in June we're actually piloting a new concept that we'll roll out properly next year, which is about celebrating menswear, the storytelling, the craftsmanship that goes into our brilliant menswear businesses and making sure that that's not just for, um, for industry but for consumers as well that we're able to tell that story. Uh, we have Fashion Week as well in September, which will be fully loaded and really exciting. And actually September September Fashion Week, I think, is the second largest um, shopping moment um, other than Christmas. So we're really looking forward to that, so not only showcasing our incredible designers on a world stage, but equally, hopefully, boosting those um, those retail figures as well. Kayla, is menswear, I mean, I don't know if margins are different, actually, in women's wear and men's wear, but I feel like, you know, Savile Row and, and some of the Savile Fair here in the UK yeah. is so towards menswear, but it gets a, a little bit less love. Is that um, fair? <laughs> well, I would say that it gets um, less probably media headlines uh, because they're not necessarily doing the fashion shows. But actually, there's such a brilliant opportunity to tell the stories. As you said, Savile Row is known the world over for its craftsmanship, is that we have people that travel the world to come to the UK. And in fact, many of the tailors on Savile Row go to international destinations and are there talking to the consumers. And there isn't a better example, really, in terms of sustainability. These are clothes that are built to last, to be adjusted and altered 
supported for many years to come and it is something to be celebrated but equally we have incredible young designers emerging designer businesses that are building a business on the world stage that have fantastic sustainability credentials and in terms of the UK is that we're known for our creativity in fact creativity I think in fashion is a hallmark for European fashion but in the UK we're known for pushing those boundaries and we're going to see some of that over the next few days which is really exciting and more importantly we're going to be talking about the future of menswear and actually how the UK as a community can really come together and to celebrate that. Yeah and I was looking at numbers again it's, it's big business Caroline thank you so much for joining us. No problem today. thank you. Caroline Rush there the Chief Executive Officer of the British Fashion Council. Now coming up we talk football Lionel Messi is turning down a 400 million dollar Saudi offer to go to Miami we have the details next. This is Bloomberg. DHL is sending a consistent message with its investments. The company spent 123 million euros to upgrade its logistics center at the Cologne Bonn Airport, designing it around key strategic goals. What I love about this building is it actually shows um, the big mega trends which formed our strategy 2025, which was inaugurated in 2019 when this building opened. So globalization, connecting the world. E-commerce, we have a lot of sortation facilities here for smaller e-commerce shipments. Sustainability, it's a very sustainable building with solar panels on the roof and everything. And digitalization, and well, you can obviously see that it is quite automated. How did the team pitch this investment to you initially, and how hard was it as a sell for them? How quickly did you turn around and say, yes, this is worth the 123 million euros. Of course, you always have to make sure that you have the right capacity for the growth in the network. And at that time, they came and said, hey, we will really see a strong growth in e-commerce volumes on top of the regular B2B growth. We need more sorting capacity. We need this building. And of course, there are always debates. Does it really have to cost 123 million euros and so on? But fortunately, they convinced us because then with COVID and the volume surge, we urgently needed the capacity. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West. Only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix. Ninety-five masks as they go outside as smoke blankets the region. This, as wildfires continue to ravage large tracts of forests in Canada, sending smoke more than 1,000 miles southward. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says it's the worst wildfire season in Canada's recorded history. Japan's economy grew more than expected in the first quarter as businesses ramped up spending. Revised data show GDP rose 2.7% annually, up from an initial reading of 1.6%. The data means Japan avoided a technical recession at the end of last. The Bank of Canada has surprised with a 25 basis point rate hike, restarting its tightening campaign. 
policymakers raised the lending rate to 4.75%, the highest in 22 years. The move ended the pause through hikes declared in January, with the BOC citing an overheating economy. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Sarah Halls, and this is Bloomberg. Francine. Sarah, thank you so much. Sarah Halls here in London. Now, ticket prices for Inter-Miami's away games are soaring after Lionel Messi announced plans to join the U.S. Major League Football team. Now, Messi's move is a significant blow to Saudi Arabia's global sports ambitions. For more, let's get straight to our Joe Easton. So, Joe, first of all, wow, Messi turned down a contract that would have basically given him $400 million dollars a year. So how, how big a deal is this? Yeah, I think it's a massive deal. I think that the negotiations with Saudi Arabia made it more high profile. Everyone thought he would either go back to Barcelona or go to Saudi Arabia. But obviously, going to the US has come as a big surprise. But I think some of the contract details are what's taken him there, potentially. There's talk of Apple potentially contributing towards some of his payment and also added us. There might be hidden details in the contract that we haven't quite heard yet. And that could be part of it, I think. I mean, I, don't, I know we're not like into the psyche of football players, but what, what would make him go there and not Saudi? Uh, well, it's already been done, I guess, with Ronaldo going over there. It may, it's, not, it's not a new thing now to go over to Saudi. There's talk of Benzema going there, even Kante from Chelsea. So kind of lots of players going over there. Whereas a high profile name going to the US David Beckham was obviously a massive one, but that was more than 15 years ago now. That changed the league, and now it's time to kind of reinvigorate that, I think. And then, Joe, we have a wonderful, wonderful piece actually looking at a breakdown of, you know, sovereign wealth money, some of the private equity money in football overall. The former Qatari PM also sweetening his deal to take over United. Yeah, so they're potentially coming back with a fifth bid, um, trying to outbid Ineos, which is owned by Jim Ratcliffe, the big UK billionaire that supports Man United. Um, the Qataris want to get it done by the open of the transfer window, which opens on Wednesday next week. So they want to be in control of the finances before Man United starts spending money to make sure they know where the money is going, make sure they're within the fair play rules in terms of finance as well. So that's exciting. That could happen potentially, according to our reporters on that story there. All right, Joe, thank you so much. So much going on, actually, when it comes to football. Uh, Joe Easton there with the very latest on potential bids. Now, bond yields are rising. Stocks are actually falling. Tech shares bearing the brunt of jitters over higher interest rates. Really, it's the unexpected decision by the Bank of Canada to restart its interest rate hiking campaign, which followed an increase earlier in the week in Australia that continues to reverberate across global markets as traders are reassessing the risks of stubborn Inflation. Coming up, as Rishi Sunak visits the U.S., we'll discuss Britain's global standing after its split from the EU. Our interview with Michel Barnier, the former chief Brexit negotiator for the European Union, is next, and this is Bloomberg. are facing some tough challenges. Higher living and education costs and wages that aren't keeping up with inflation are making it harder for them to support themselves. And they're relying more on the bank of mom and dad. A new bank rate report shows nearly 70% of parents with kids 18 and older are putting their own finances in danger to help them. About half are dipping into their emergency savings or delaying paying off debt, while 43% drain their retirement funds. So where do you draw the line? There seems to be a generational gap as older parents can't understand why being self-sufficient now is a lot harder than it was for them. Gen Z seems to think on average that 22 is a benchmark for covering the expenses, while baby boomers say their adult children should pay their own way closer to age 20. Either way, it's a family decision. Bank rates suggest having a conversation with your kids and setting a specific dollar amount or time frame for footing the bill. Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, aren't you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed does yeah. potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. 
multi-trillion dollar industry. There's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ. Monday on Bloomberg. on the product may read made in the USA, but the sign on the CEO's door often says made in India. Alphabet's Sundar Pichai, Microsoft's Satya Nadella, IBM's Arvind Krishna, Micron Technologies' Sanjay Mehotra, and that's just the start. Add in the chief executives of Adobe, Deloitte, Gap, VMware, and that doesn't count Indians running companies all over the world. Why have so many Indians risen to the top? But no Kosla points to India's incredibly competitive education system. If you can survive the pressure it takes to get into one of the Indian institutes of technology, it gives you confidence to handle American universities and later the business world. Meanwhile, the belief in India's ability to produce so many tech wizards is reinforced every year. Indians make up about three-fourths of the immigrants receiving coveted H-1B visas for the U.S. And it's a safe bet that some of them will eventually find their way to the C-suite. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, they call it the special relationship, and that's being put to the test this week as British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak visits America. Now, the UK is seeking closer economic ties with the United States. Sunak will meet President Biden later today, but don't expect progress on a free trade agreement. Now, the White House has maintained a freeze on talks, and the UK Prime Minister says a trade deal is not a priority right now. He says the focus is on making sure that their economic partnership reflects the challenges and opportunities of the time, and that includes support for Ukraine, responding to China's growing influence, green subsidies, and cooperation on regulating AI. The visit comes as Britain seeks to boost its global standing after Brexit. Now, let's unpack all of this with Michel Barnier, the EU's former chief Brexit negotiator, who's also now the author of a book, My Secret Brexit Diary, which we'll get to in a second. And we're also joined by Leslie Vingemarie, director of the US and America's program at Chatham House. So thank you both uh, for joining us. This is a big day, certainly for the UK and for Rishi Sunak, as he um, will spend a bit of time with President Biden. Does, how does the US now, now view the UK post-Brexit? Oh, good morning. And frankly speaking, I, I wish the best for this visit from Rishi Sunak to President Biden and meeting many people, key businessmen and in, in, in the States. Um, as usual, uh, there is a special relation between the UK and US, v very, very long in history and very strong. And once again, I, I wish the best. As far as trade is concerned, at the end of the road or at the beginning of the road, uh, there is an economic reality. Uh, we are now in two separate markets, UK and EU. And uh, the reality is that the EU market, single market, count 450 million consumers and citizens, 22 million business. That is the reality. And uh, if you are on the side of the US or China or India, uh, they know this reality. Yeah, and Leslie, I mean, what, what the Prime Minister really wants is this agreement, right, which we've been talking, which actually we were promised by Boris Johnson. It, it, will they ever get it? And if so, it, it, is, there, I mean, is there any willingness from the US to, to give something to the UK in terms of trade? I think right now it's very clear that that sort of idea of a U.S.-U.K. free trade deal has been parked for quite some time. But so I think what Rishi Sunak is trying to do, and, and quite frankly, uh, probably President Biden is trying to do, is to find wins where there can be economic cooperation, whether it's that U.S. UK critical minerals deal, which would help br the British automobile industry in particular to be competitive on electric vehicles, selling them into the U.S. market. Uh, but I think the real economic win that the UK is looking for is this, this focus on artificial intelligence. So if, if, if Prime Minister Sunak can make an announcement about an autumn summit on artificial intelligence, really forge a partnership with the US and be seen to be uh, leading when it comes to setting standards, 
asking some of the big questions about regulation, but keeping that space open for innovation, I think that's a really sweet spot for the UK. But Liz, is there something that the US actually needs the UK on? Does it need the UK on AI or would it be throwing them a bone in return for something else? I think, I think we have to put it in the perspective that right now economic issues are seen to be security issues. And when you think about security, the UK is a leading partner across the board. So it's quite natural for the UK to be important to the US when it comes to economic security. And that means artificial intelligence, that means technology clearly affected by Brexit. There's no doubt about that, but still with tremendous scope, again, for innovation, the firms that are based here in the UK. And so I think when you sort of put it in that broader light, which everything right now has got to be put in, whether it's with respect to competition with China, support for Ukraine, transatlantic security, that economic question is really, you know, one pillar. It's very much integrated into that broader set of issues. And uh, Mr. Banya, you negotiated very harshly with the UK at the time you'd warned, of course, the government that there would be consequences economically. Do you think Brexit has gone better or worse than you expected? The, the Brexit is a loser's game. There is no winner. Uh, so it's a divorce. Uh, uh, As many people know, the divorce is always painful and costly. So there is a loser's game, and uh, we try to, um, to face the consequences. And outside, the Brexit is over. The Brexit is uh, on the books. Huh? Uh, and uh, we, 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 we spend our energy, our intelligence on the, the future of Europe, much more than the Brexit. But uh, I can understand that there is now a, for the UK to face the concrete and mechanical consequences of the Brexit. And as I said at the very beginning of the negotiation, uh, five years ago, uh, mm -hmm. there is multiple consequences on every and each uh, subject of the uh, daily life. Huh? But there, there's um, at the moment a negotiation, right, for between the UK and the EU on, on car factory rules. The European Union has so far downplayed the chances of a deal with the UK on this. Do you think they will be a bit more friendly as you know, th this government and, and the current commission seem to be getting along better? The, the, the point is not to be more friendly or less friendly. We face the, the clearly and mechanically the consequences of the Brexit. And as far as uh, uh, the, the car industry is concerned, uh, as far as uh, financial services are concerned, uh, Brexit means Brexit. You can be out or in the single market at the same time. You, can, you cannot dance into wedding at the same but, time. I, and I understand, but, but you can re, re, you know, put the rules in a way that's more advantageous for, for both parties and not. That, that's fair, right? You can come uh, to agreements. Uh, as far it is for the both parties. Right. But the, the, the task and the duty of the European Commission, the European Parliament, the member state, is to defend the EU interests. And as I said, we can, we can face a situation where there is a kind of cherry picking uh, in the single market. The single market is our main asset. The main reason why the China or US respect us is the single market, which is much more than a free trade zone. It is a, clearly an a ecosystem with common norms, common norms, common standards, the same regulation, same supervision, and the same jurisdiction. So it is a single market. So we cannot accept any kind of unraveling of the single market, never. Um, Leslie, it is also pretty incredible, actually, to, to know that this is real quality time for the first time between a prime minister of the UK and a president of the US. Is Rishi Sunak giving the US what they need on Ukraine and also on trying to deal with China? I think on Ukraine, certainly. I think on this broader question of Europe, uh, the US is looking to see whether, uh, whether the UK is sorting out its relationship with Europe, whether it can provide this, you know, convening power, some alternative space. On China, I think the UK is very much hewing to the US line, setting out, you know, an, an independent policy. But when you read the details, whether it's in the integrated re review refresh, the, the foreign policy strategy document, it's very much aligned with the way that the US uh, is, is approaching China on technology, um, uh, on the tilt to the Indo-Pacific, which has been achieved, but it's still very significant. So I think there is a real alignment there. But again, for the UK to sort of provide the US what it needs, I think demonstrating that it can forge a positive, productive relationship post-Brexit with Europe, that's the challenge for the current government. That's certainly 
the challenge for whatever government emerges after the next election. But if President Biden has to call someone in Europe, who does he call first? Emmanuel Macron of France really tried to position himself as the person to call. Has that worked? Yeah, I mean, I, obviously the U.S. has set up this technology and trade council with, um, with Europe. That's one forum. But I think there are multiple phone lines coming out of the White House. And I think that relationship with the U.K. on security is very robust. Security, defense, intelligence, trade and technology, the security aspects of that, clearly Europe is extremely important, but I don't think it's either or. How much has the EU lost because of Brexit? We lost a, a key member state, and this member state is no longer a member state, it's a, now alone, and I think in the global world where we are and what we face, it's better not to be alone, to be together. But coming back to the EU-UK relations, um, I, I spent four and five years on this negotiation with three goals in my, main, my head. Number one, protecting the single market. It's for now and for the future. No cherry picking. Number two, the peace in Ireland. Number three, building the best framework as possible for the future relation. Because we have so many challenges to face together, UK and EU together. Uh, uh, you, you speak about uh, inte artificial intelligence, we can speak about terrorism, we can speak about poverty in Africa, we can speak about global uh, climate change. There is so many challenges. We need to be together. That's the reason why I think that we can improve the, our relations, uh, in particular for defense and security. Let me recall that at the beginning of the negotiation, I have proposed to Mr. Uh, Johnson to open the chapter on security, defense, and cooperation with Africa. And he refused to open this chapter. Now it's time with Mr. Sunak to, to begin this negotiation. Mr. Bagnet, do you think there's a, there's a possibility that the UK would ever re enter the EU, or is that is that a, never going to happen? No, it's, the, the door is open any time. Any time. Uh, the door is open. The only point I want to mention, it, it has a, uh, I, I don't know when <laughs> it, for the UK people, for the UK citizens to decide uh, in total sovereignty. The point is to know, at that time, what will be the size of the divergence on the regulations for social regulations, environmental regulations, fiscal regulations. Because when you join the EU, or when you join the single market, you can be inside the single market, outside of the EU, as Norway. Uh, when you join the EU or the single market, the custom union, you have to respect the norms, the standards, the conditions of the EU. So the point is to know what will be at that time, I don't know when, yeah. the size the size of the divergence. All right, Mr. Barnier, thank you so much. Labour, of course, talking about cl building close relationships, so we'll discuss that shortly. Also, thank you to Leslie Vinjamuri there from Chatham House. And so now we'll have plenty more, of course, on this special relationship, and we'll have plenty more on Brexit with Michel Barnier. This is Bloomberg. Okay, so you're moving in on me quick, distracting oh, yeah. me with your fancy hands. <laughs> I'm going to deal with your knight because he's really bothering me. Ah, my knights. Yeah, he's a troublemaker. Yeah. What did you get up to this weekend? Uh, you know, just robot stuff. A lot of chess. I was practicing for uh, for you. I know you're pretty good. Ooh, I don't like that. I will take this. Uh, put it over here. Not cool. Not cool. All right. I will. I will concede. I can see. Ah. You got me beat. <laughs> Very good game. Well played. Thank you, sir. Thank you. live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. Get the latest from and about politics' biggest power players at the end of every trading day. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Welcome back to Bloomberg Day 
break Europe. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open... This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, still with us, Michel Barnier, the EU's former chief Brexit negotiator. Now, Mr. Barnier is also author of My Secret Brexit Diary, a behind the scenes look at the talks with the UK. It's a simple read because actually it reads a lot like a dear diary. So you have dates, and there's one, Mr. Barnier, that really, um, you, you know, stuck with it. It's funny because every day you, you call, for example, Wednesday, the 6th of February 2019, a place in hell. And it's a quite personal account of your. Brexit negotiations. Are you a little bit sad about how it ended? And Labour has been talking about a closer relationship between the UK and the EU. Do you think that will happen and what would it look like? Uh, first of all, I wrote this book every day or every night to tell the truth of this negotiation because I thought from the day one that it will be an historical negotiation. Uh, I'm sad about the Brexit. I, I didn't understand uh, uh, why a, a great country took uh, such a decision, in my view, against its own national economic interest. But uh, we have respected this vote and we have delivered the Brexit in the best way as possible. Uh, if it's possible to, to deliver um, uh, uh, a divorce mm -hmm. in the best way. Huh? So I try to do that in respecting every day the, the UK, uh, because I have lots of respect and admiration for this country. Uh, respecting my counterpart, but also um, defending every day, uh, protecting the integrity of the single market. So, uh, wh whatever the, the, the future of the next or a future government in the UK will be, uh, we, we are open. The door is open for any uh, relation, uh, negotiation, but. The condition will be, in any case, that the single market will be respected. But where do you see the opportunities of working closer together on opportunities? Are there parts of the economy or defense that you think would fit you know, t together nicely? We can improve our relations. For instance, the very specific relation I spoke about, uh, uh, veterinary uh, exchanges to f f facilitate the trades. But uh, the, all the rules uh, have to be respected. Uh, the, the paradox of this negotiation, to be frank, is that for the first time in our trade history, 60 years, we have signed perhaps 50 or 55 uh, trade agreements with Canada recently, with Japan, and we have negotiated several new ones. Uh, the fact is that for the very first time, we have negotiated a trade agreement with a third country, UK, mm -hmm. to rebuild barriers and not to delete barriers. We have rebuilt all the barriers, except the, 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 the financial barriers, the, the tariffs. But we have rebuilt all the barriers between UK and EU because of the Brexit. So this is a, the, the, the reality or the paradox of this negotiation. I think we can improve to facilitate uh, the, the relations. We can improve our relations by a new chapter on security, mm -hmm. defense, uh, fight against terrorism. Uh, we can uh, uh, improve our, our relation for the cooperation with Africa to tackle the new challenges about the intelligence, artificial intelligence and the new technologies. I think we have a lot of room to, to improve our relations. Uh, Mr. Banya, you also talk extensively about personalities, you know, personalities that we've all followed very closely. Do you think the negotiation would have been different for with a pragmatist like Prime Minister Rishi Sunak? I think uh, that Rishi Sunak shows a, a goodwill. The reason why we succeed to finally Three years after succeed to implement the protocol on Ireland with Rishi Sunak, and we lost two years with Mr. Johnson. So uh, I think uh, is a good will. But uh, whatever the, new, the government of the UK will be, we are ready to improve our relations. And we need to improve our relations, taking into account the Brexit, which is done, yeah. but improving our relations in particular for defense and security. But do you think that had you negotiated with Rishi Sunak, the outcome of Brexit would have been different? the deal would have been different. Uh, Rishi Sunak was a member of the government of Mr. Johnson. So I think uh, uh, 
the prime minister give the, the line uh, on the name of the government and on the name of his majority. This is the same majority. I don't, I don't want to speculate about what would have been this negotiation, but it, it had been painful. But we have always been respectful for the UK, and uh, I asked just to, to the UK to respect its own signature, which is not the case for Mr. Johnson about the Irish protocol. In, in the corridors of power of Brussels and France and Germany, do people still talk about Brexit? No, no. Uh, the, 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 the Brexit is done, the Brexit is in the books, uh, and we are, as Mrs. Merkel said once, the future of Europe is much more important than Brexit, and we have so many challenges to face, in particular the war in Ukraine, the stability of the continent, um, uh, the, 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 new, the new policy for, for industry in Europe, and to, uh, the, the climate change. So we have so many, so many challenges to face. And what I wish is that to be, to be more successful, we need to build a strong cooperation with the UK to face together such uh, many, many of this, these challenges. Do you think there, there, there's a danger that more countries in Europe will follow down the UK path and, and leave the Union? No, I don't think so. Uh, the, the, the consequence of this negotiation, very long and complex negotiation, is that now we no longer listen leaders like Mrs. Le Pen in France, or Mrs. Salvini in Italy, speaking about leaving the, 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 the EU, leaving the single currency. But we have to be careful because uh, the Brexit was improbable, mm -hmm. even for the leader of the Brexit campaign, and it happened. And we have to be careful about some situation which, which seems to be improbable, and it could happen, so we have to draw the lesson. The third chapter of my book is called A Warning. Mm -hmm. We have to answer, to understand the social anger in many regions. It's too late for the UK, but it's not too late for the other member of the country, the, the EU, we have to listen to understand, to answer to this yeah. social anger in many regions. Michel Barnier, thank you so much for joining us today. That was the EU's former chief Brexit negotiator and now author of the book, My Secret Brexit Diary. Diary not so secret anymore. Now you can hear more from Michel Barnier in an extended interview on our podcast, Bloomberg UK Politics, also available to download from all of our usual platforms. Coming up, making Britain's pitch for AI, Rishi Sunak seeks Joe Biden's backing as he hopes to boost the UK's influence over regulating the technology. We'll explore that next, and this is Bloomberg. source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30am only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Japan's critical role in the global economy is changing as the world recalibrates. After decades of stagnation, Japan's leaders are forging a more innovative and sustainable path forward to revitalize the nation. Corporate giants, policymakers, and pioneers tell us how they're doing just that. Every week on Japan Ahead, right here on Bloomberg Television. The top names at the Fed are on Bloomberg. Right now, if you had to tip the scales, the next move is going to be an increase or a cut. It's pretty heavily weighted to the increase for me. Nobody covers the Fed like Bloomberg. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts. Via live and on-demand webinars, only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Our studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts of the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. 
Business Week Radio. Live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, are you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed yeah. does potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. seen uh, the number of people with crypto assets double uh, in the past year to 5 million. Uh, we think it's important to ensure that the way in which uh, crypto firms advertise to those consumers uh, is clear, fair and not misleading. So these are new tougher advertising standards um, and they're seeking to ensure that we treat crypto assets like high risk investments um, and that the firms are not able uh, to just uh, put out misleading adverts. That was Sheldon Mills, executive director of the UK's Financial Conduct Authority, speaking to us earlier about tougher rules around crypto assets. Now, let's also look at markets, and a lot of the focus, of course, is on inflation, the fact that we had central banks, two central banks that surprised a lot of economists, and high rates means there's a global repricing on the impact longer term of inflation, what that means for the Fed and the ECB. Now, staying with the UK and the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, calling for Britain to be included in the future of AI regulation. Well, Sunak is making the push ahead of time talks with President Biden in Washington, a meeting which he hopes will boost UK influence over regulating the technology. Joining us now is Brendan Scott, Bloomberg's UK economics and government managing editor. So thank you so much, Brendan, for joining us. First of all, Sunak talking so much about AI. Is he trying to, to get this as a win for, for the UK? Yeah, I think he's looking for some sort of common ground with President Biden. Uh, the UK has had a hard time finding things that it can relate to with the US ever since Brexit. Uh, this is a this is a new issue. It's one that he's been uh, talking about for quite a long time. The debate over it has changed since he's first brought it up. But it's uh, he, I think he sees this as a place where he can try to get something that works with Biden, get something going, and maybe it leads to other things down the road, like he would hope some sort of trade discussion, if not a trade deal. So, Shabana, what does this say about the, the state of the relationship? I don't know if it's, you know, if this is the only thing he can get from the U.S., so as you say, you know, trying to get in through AI and then hoping for more, or whether, well, at least, you know, th this is probably also the biggest challenge of our lifetime, so whether this is actually a win-win. Yeah, I mean, I think as he sees it as a forward-looking issue. It's also the UK and the US security relationship is, you know, is ironclad. It's it's one of the closest in the world. It's certainly among the top two or three relationships that the US has on a, on a security level. Uh, the, the Prime Minister has set out on this trip trying to make it more of, a, of an economic discussion as well. AI is a security issue. It's also an economic issue. This is a way to bridge that. Yeah. Brendan, thank you so much. Brendan Scott, they're Bloomberg's UK economics and government managing editor. Now, also, listen to our podcast for banks. AI is like having an army of interns. We spoke to one of our columnists, Parmi Olsen, and um, a, a chief executive that works specifically in AI. So we really look at the podcast in the city that I co-host with Dave Merritt, and we look at the uh, crosshairs between AI banking and the UK. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. We're not going to be relying upon countries whose values we don't share. To the world of business. It's all about corporate power in the end. Balance of power. Live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. We well, couldn't be more excited about what's in store for you. How long will it take? How many years? Why don't we take this one day at a time? Good luck. Everybody has a perspective. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, join host Anne-Marie Hordern. It's the one area, really, of bipartisanship. Well, I think we're getting more of it. That's it's optimistic. And Joe Matthew. The debt ceiling is looming. How close are we going to get to the line before you start to worry? Alongside Kaylee Lyons. The door was open for regulators to do more. And that puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place. As they deliver news. This is such an important economic issue. He's Bless no me. longer trying to run away from that. Me. Really a blue some mind. Insight. We can both invest in law enforcement and also make sure that communities feel safe in their own skin. And analysis. I think your audience will get this more than most. This is not the Republican Party that you know. It allows him to do what he did so successfully in 2020 which is run against crazy. From and about politics' biggest power players. This was the zombie case, and it's now more than well alive. 
That's for sure. Uh, with two more potentially to come. I'm willing to have this battle. It is vitally important. This is the intersection of Washington and Wall Street. Bringing people directly to the decision makers right. that impact your investments and your life. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. From the world of politics to the world of business, Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, hosts Anne Marie Hordern and Joe Matthew, alongside Kaylee Lines, deliver news, insight, and analysis live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. Get the latest from and about politics' biggest power players at the end of every trading day. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Markets count down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. This is Bling Bang. is as safe as it was when you were in the government? It's not as safe as it was. Crime is clearly rising. I mean, it's not back to the dark old days of, you know, pre-Giuliani in the early 90s. But we got to be careful because safety is the foundation of everything. And so I know the current mayor is committed to reducing crime. Um, but we're going to have to be incredibly aggressive in making sure that crime does not increase. Are you involved any longer in New York City matters or your advisor? Yeah, the City? mayor and governor actually asked me to co-chair a panel or a task force on reviving the commercial districts throughout the city. So I've been in the middle of that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Reality check. Global stocks and bonds digest two surprise rate hikes this week, reminding investors that the inflation fight isn't over. Wall Street may soon face fresh compliance costs in the United States after a reprieve from Europe's tough MIFID II rules expires next month. And a warning from BlackRock, Vice Chairman Philip Hildebrand says investors must reassess their allocations to China amid rising geopolitical tensions with the US and a slowing economy. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. And Kriti, I feel like saying, oh, Canada. You're dealing with the uh, air quality <laughs> issues, of course, from the wildfire, uh, wildfires in North America. Uh, but also on the markets, we're dealing with a surprise rate hike from the Bank of Canada coming close on the heels of the RBA's surprise. Yeah, who knew Canada would have such a big impact in just the 24-hour <laughs> span in terms of both Wall Street and Main Street, for, for that matter? Something, of course, we're going to digest throughout the rest of the show. But something really important to keep in mind is the read through you are seeing from the Bank of Canada into what exactly the Fed pricing is. But look, it's not just the Bank of Canada. The RBA played a little bit of a role here as well. These surprise hikes to the upside really suggesting that, wait, maybe we got to hold on for a second and say, look, maybe inflation is not over. And if that isn't going to kind of increase those Fed hike bets, that's what you're seeing priced into the bond market and really led to the surprise on both sides of the border uh, in, in North America yesterday. You're seeing that show up in the two-year yield a little bit, 455 here, because remember, overnight, Fed swaps are now pricing in a little bit more hawkishness from the Fed. Whether that translates into kind of a ripple effect for the equity market still remains unknown, because for now, you're kind of seeing the equity market remain flat from the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ futures perspective. But I threw on here and said Russell 2000 futures, because Anna is still a big part of the conversation. It's not just inflation. It's not just growth. It's breath in the stock market. And you are starting to see a little bit of that as those small caps get in on the rally, as shown by Russell 2000 futures, higher by three-tenths of 1% already in the pre-market. So those are some early signs that perhaps we can enter a bull market when it comes to equities. But again, the bond market could change the game when we start to price in those hawkish bets. I think the FX gauge is really crucial here because the dollar actually weakening. If you are expecting more hawkishness from the Federal Reserve, the dollar, in theory, should strengthen. Yet that's not exactly what's happening. Weakness in the greenback to the tune of about three-tenths of 1%. A lot of international factors playing to that. We're going to get to that in a second. NYMEX crude, though, 
trading with a 72 handle down about five tenths of one percent. Again, reflecting a little bit of those growth concerns. But Anna, I mentioned uh, the Asia story because it is absolutely hitting the dollar. Overnight, you saw Asia weak by about three tenths of one percent overall in the entire region. So seeing that show up in the MSCI Asia Pacific Index. But again, I want to come back to the currency story because you also got some GDP data out of Japan, which we know has been dealing with growth concerns. They're actually posting better than expected GDP, saying the economy is actually recovering. Resilience is a factor. So you are seeing strength there in the Japanese yen, uh, 139.74 on that cross pair. Outperformance in China, though, as we talk about that bid into tech, into AI, the CSI 300 really outperformed and was the outperformer throughout the entire region, higher by about eight tenths of 1%. But it's coming at a time when China is exploring stimulus. And this is a really big deal, a big chunk of Chinese lenders talking about cutting their reserve ratios and that really potentially propping up the offshore yuan as well. So you are seeing that as well, 714 on that currency pair, Anna. Yeah, and will we see further action from the PBOC, Bloomberg Economics, certainly talking about the possibility of that by mid-June. Let's get to the European equity market picture. And whilst I show you this pretty mixed picture on European equities, I'll just go through some of the breaking news that we had uh, for, on the euro area economy, contracting by 0.1% in the first quarter on the quarter. So this is this Q on Q number, and I think that's two quarters of negative. Uh, so that would be a technical recession. So we'll get uh, more details on that shortly. This is the picture across European equity markets. We've got the CAC going higher, the DAX going higher, shrugging off earlier weakness actually on European stocks. The IBEX and the FTSE MIB, just like yesterday, we're seeing outperformance coming through from some of these southern European markets. The FTSE, much of a laggard this morning. So that's the picture in terms of the another aviation company tells us about the strength of the sort of booking pipeline ahead and prepares itself for a busy summer. Yeah, resilience seems to be the theme across Main Street around the world, Anna. But on Wall Street, a little bit of a different story, headed for a regulatory fight over how clients pay for investment research when a reprieve from Europe's MIFID II rules expires next month. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Leonard Ken Sherper. Tell us a little bit about the background to the story. We know that Europe and U the U.S. have really disagreed on this front in the past. What are the developments here? Yes, exactly. So these MIFID two rules say that brokers have to charge separately for um, trading and research. And so far, I think for the past five years, the SEC has shielded U.S. brokers from that requirement because it would basically mean more costs for, for these firms. And um, now that um, reprieve, that shield, is going to expire next month, and we're already seeing a bit of pushback uh, from, from the industry. And it will be very interesting to see how that plays out because Gary Gensler said, uh, don't expect uh, a further extension. Yeah, Gans are certainly suggesting, you know, we've told you this, we told you it's coming, uh, get ready. Now, on another subject of uh, interest in the financial services sector, Standard Chartered trimming more than 100 roles as part of a cost-cutting plan. Which are the roles that are affected here, and what are the particular catalysts that we're hearing? Exactly. So, in Asia, our colleagues report it's going to be HR roles, and in London it's going to be a few uh, managing directors in financial markets. Um, the company said this is part of their normal uh, review of, of business, of course, um, uh, but it also comes against the backdrop of a drop in, in uh, trading revenue in the first quarter and also against the backdrop of these gloomy forecasts that we've seen from uh, U.S. bank executives last week, for example. Yeah, certainly been a theme. Job losses in the financial services sector. Leo, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Leo Ken Sherpa with the latest on those uh, themes in finance. Now, around the world, investors are struggling to process how to deploy capital as recession risks and geopolitical tensions shake global markets. Earlier on Bloomberg, Vice, uh, uh, Black, sorry, BlackRock's Vice Chairman Philip Hildebrand said investors must reassess their allocations to China. Certainly the, the fragmentation of global geopolitics in a sense, and at the core of this, of course, is the tension between the U.S. and China, means that you have a very different set of assumptions when it comes to allocating. So what might have been you know, an obvious kind of play to say we need to increase allocation to China is now has a different calculus driving it, given the uh, clearly the increased political risk premium. Joining us now with analysis, Bloomberg Markets reporter Justina Lee. How widespread is that view then, rethinking allocation to China, either because, uh, Justina, of the geopolitics and those longer-term concerns, or around the lack of momentum behind the Chinese rebound uh, from reopening? 
Yeah, I think those concerns are pretty widespread right now. I mean, as you said, one part of the story is the cyclical part. We all know that Chinese economic recovery has been sputtering, you know, recently. And on the other hand, I think more worryingly is the long-term structural story. And one part of that is, you know, the worsening relations with the U.S. And the other part of that is, you know, China's aging. Still good news, you know, like what, what we're seeing across the developed world. But I think the question is, you know, where do we go kind of going forward, especially with perhaps, you know, inflation starting to weigh on consumption as well. Justina, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Justina Lee with uh, those market themes from China to Japan. Let's get back to some Western politics. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak wooed US business leaders and politicians as he engaged in baseball diplomacy, we're told, the day before he meets President Joe Biden at the White House. Joining us now, Bloomberg UK Economics and Government Managing Editor Brendan Scott with me on set. Rishi Sunak there in those images doing a good impression of a baseball fan for somebody who actually prefers cricket. Um, what, do we, what do we make of this so-called baseball diplomacy? It makes me think of US-Cuban relations or somebody showing up at your house with a baseball bat, neither of which are intended connections here. So what do we make of this uh, this effort? I, I think what you're seeing there is someone who's trying to show that he's familiar with America. He's a Stanford grad. He's he's someone who's comfortable in an American setting. He, he wants... Uh, he also wants the, the not just the American people, but the decision makers in Washington to see that, to see that he's uh, to get to know him a bit better. Uh, he's, he's only been prime minister since October. Uh, he hasn't had much chance to interact with uh, the, UK, the U.S.'s decision makers uh, on a one-to-one -one level. And so this is a chance for him to, to really do that and, and, and show that to the world as well. Talk to us a little bit about the technology frontier. It feels like perhaps the U.K. in some ways feels left out of that global conversation. Where does Sunak stand on that in, relative to the U.S.? Yeah, of course, the UK, London uh, are are big uh, tech centers themselves. They have there's a lot of investment here. There's a lot of uh, uh, people involved in the industry in in the UK. He uh, Rishi Sunak's trying to leverage that, trying to m get himself in this conversation, uh, which right now is uh, being dominated by the by the bigger blocks, uh, the US, Europe, uh, and and of course China. So this is a chance uh, bringing up, bringing up uh, AI in this context. Uh, he sees this as a source of common ground, potentially, between him and Biden, uh, and p potentially a way to uh, steer the conversation, which has been very security-focused since the start of the Ukraine war, towards something a bit more economic. Mm, yes, and so he wants to base a sort of AI uh, regulatory hub in the UK, doesn't he? So we'll see where that conversation goes. Brendan, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Bloomberg's uh, Brandon Scott with the latest on the UK politics and that visit to Washington. Coming up, investors reassessing rate hike bets as the Bank of Canada joins the RBA with a surprise hike less than a week away from the Fed's decision. More on that next. BlackRock's Jean Boivin seeing uh, rates higher for longer with any cut unlikely this year. That conversation is still ahead. Plus, the Super Return Conference is in full swing in Berlin. We will bring you our live interview with Joe Taylor, CEO of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. This is Bloomberg. call it 18 years at Chipotle, this was, you come into Chipotle along the line, you interact with the crew, and you customize your meal. We've got this separate make line, and it's digitized, and so the orders come in, and they're, they're really kind of staged so that if you say at noon, I want to come in at 1 o'clock, we hold that order, and we will send it to the crew like maybe 10 to 1, right. so it's ready right when you pull up your car. How do you manage these kind of two different staffing needs, right? Yes. And making sure you have the right amount of people yes. at the, at the right, right time. We spend a lot of time uh, projecting sales. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, it's part art, part science. We're trying to bring more science and more AI into it. Because yeah. if you get the right sales projection, 
then you know exactly what your sale, what your staffing needs to be. So if you get the sales right, you can get the entire restaurant staffed perfectly with just a couple of people. Our, our average restaurant now does about um, over a million dollars per restaurant in digital sales. Today's CFOs are reshaping the C-suite. Bloomberg's chief future officer shines a spotlight on these dynamic leaders. From the wizards and capitals to new ventures and innovative investment, running a sports empire in Washington, D.C. is a monumental task. Owner Ted Leonsis trusts CFO Peter Bichet to execute monumental sports and entertainment's financial game plan. We are definitely in growth mode. What else can we do? How do we grow the platform? Watch Chief Future Officer, Wednesday on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, it's been an interesting 48 hours because the narrative has completely changed when it comes to central banking around the world. You can blame the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Bank of Canada for that story. It has a very real read-through into the markets, which brings me to a chart for our radio audience. Stick with me here. We are looking at global bond yields, essentially on the front end of the curve. Uh, kind of normalized here, but basically what you need to know, yields, Canada, U.S., Australia, Germany, New Zealand, basically a lot of these major economies, the yields are are going up, up, up. And a lot of this has to do simply with repricing what these central banks are going to do, that we are not near the end of this global monetary tightening regime. Instead, we may have much, much farther to go. And this is extremely important in the context of the Federal Reserve because, of course, we do think that, well, the Fed kind of does its own thing, given that it has the backing of the dollar being the reserve uh, currency for the world. But to what extent do they need to start kind of ripping a page out of playbooks from other central banks around the world? And that's where you're starting to see a little bit of the pricing change. On this topic, I want to bring in a true expert. Bloomberg's Phil Serafino, a fellow American, I might as well add, uh, joins us now to break it all down. Phil, you're an American. You know all about American exceptionalism, that the idea that perhaps the Federal Reserve will be different at the end of the day. Will it? Talk to us about pricing here. Yeah, I mean... The message you're getting from, from Canada, from Australia is, hey, inflation is still a problem. We need to bring it under control. I was looking at the headline inflation rates around the world, uh, the U.S. 4.9 percent, you know, the euro area 6.1 percent. That's way above what the central banks want to see. Everyone says inflation should be around 2 percent. So that tells you that there's probably more rate hikes coming. You know, the case can be made, look, there's been a lot of increases already, and that's working its way through the system, and inflation is coming down, and it will keep coming down. But, you know, central banks are not going to sit back and take a chance that they, they get behind the curve, and that's the message you've seen this week. Rates are going up. Mm. And if you're a government and you need to raise money, Phil, and you are also increasingly making the assumption that rates continue to rise, you might decide to issue now rather than wait. We're seeing quite a lot of issue, and it's not least here in Europe. Yeah, this week alone, uh, sovereign issuers in the U.S. sold $27 billion of debt, busiest week since 2020. So they are clearly taking advantage of this moment now before they see another, uh, another round of rate increases coming. Uh, this week in Asia, there's been a big bout of corporate issuance as well. So the debt capital markets are really, you know, issuers are rushing to borrow that money now before the interest rates go up. Phil, are they going to be met with appetite, though? Isn't the story of liquidity and digesting this issuance around the world still a big issue? Yeah, I mean, that, that can be a problem. There's been a lot of concern about that. I will say, though, it seems like there has been a lot of appetite for uh, especially high-grade bonds. Uh, you, know, you, have, you have buyers like insurance companies that have been starved for years when rates were low, and uh, they, they still have an appetite for debt. The question is, when do we hit that tipping point when, when it's just too much? Uh, you know, so far, the market has been very receptive to these issues. Uh, we'll see how that goes if, if there's a little bit of stress in the system as, as rates go higher. Mm. I know that we've got some comments from uh, Ray Dalio on that subject. We'll play those later in the program. Phil, thank you very much. Phil Serafino joining us there from Paris. And for more market analysis, check out the Markets Live blog. You can find that uh, by uh, typing into the Bloomberg terminal, NLIV Go. This is Bloomberg.
Business Week Radio. Live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, are you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Messer and Tim Stenevec bring you the latest news from the world. And they're relying more. And they're relying more on the bank of mom and dad. A new bank rate report shows nearly 70% of parents with kids 18 and older are putting their own finances in danger to help them. About half are dipping into their emergency savings or delaying paying off debt, while 43% drain their retirement funds. So where do you draw the line? There seems to be a generational gap as older parents can't understand why being self-sufficient now is a lot harder than it was for them. Gen Z seems to think on average that 22 is a benchmark for covering the expenses, while baby boomers say their adult children should pay their own way closer to age 20. Either way, it's a family decision. Bank rate suggests having a conversation with your kids and setting a specific dollar amount or time frame for footing the bill. PSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit pso.org slash now, where the music plays on. PSO season sponsor, Bank of America. Our studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts of the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West. Only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Some 230 square miles of Ukraine's southern Kherson region is underwater two days after the, the destruction of the Kahovka Dam. The regional governor says almost a third of the flood zone, where thousands are being evacuated, is held by Ukrainian forces, while the rest is in Russian-occupied territory. Kyiv is assessing the humanitarian, economic, and ecological damage of the disaster that Western leaders denounced as a war crime. Bloomberg has learned a mood of deepening gloom is gripping Russia's elite about prospects for President Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine. Many within the political and business elite are tired of the war and want it to stop, though they doubt Putin will halt the fighting, according to seven people familiar with the situation who asked not to be identified. The mayor of New York has told residents to stay indoors or wear N95 masks if they go outside as the most polluted air in decades blankets the region. This is as wildfires continue to ravage large tracts of forest in Canada, sending smoke more than 1,000 miles southwards. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says it's the worst wildfire season in Canada's recorded history. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy called off votes for the remainder of the week and sent lawmakers home. A revolt by Republican hardliners halted business in the chamber for a second day. The blockade by a band of 11 ultra-conservatives heightened tensions among Republicans following the Speaker's backing of a compromise with the White House to avert a U.S. debt default. The Speaker says he was blindsided by the revolt. Soccer superstar Lionel Messi is reportedly planning to join U.S. Major League Club Inter-Miami. The Argentine legend revealed the move to Spanish newspaper Mundo Deportivo. It would mean he's foregoing a contract in Saudi Arabia worth a reported $400 million a year. The newspaper says Messi's being offered profit-sharing agreements with Adidas and Apple, and ESPN even says he may get a stake in the club, joining co-owner David Beckham. A fascinating story, Anna, just on the heels of so much kind of sport and enthusiasm coming out of mm. the Middle East. I mean, we'll talk about the U.S. story and angle in a moment, but this is coming on the heels of the merger between the Saudi-backed kind of golf tournament with the PGA Tour. This is coming on the back of Cristiano Ronaldo uh, in Riyadh right now playing for a Saudi team. And, of course, uh, last year the FIFA World Cup held in Qatar. It's fascinating how, how sports are kind of taking over the Middle East. 
Yeah, and the role of these big Middle Eastern players is really interesting, isn't it? Our Big Take story today actually features uh, the, the world of, of, of global football, of soccer, and talks about the, the, the billionaires who are buying up these clubs. And in that, we've seen quite a lot of success from those uh, from the Middle East. So, for example, the Saudis buying a team in the northeast of England with uh, uh, quite a lot of focus uh, news-wise on that. We've seen the Qataris still going after Manchester United, coming hot on the heels of their World Cup uh, success. So, uh, clearly looking to exercise that soft power by both buying clubs and attracting talent to their home teams. I wonder, though, in the Messi situation, you know, you can take the geopolitical view and say, look, uh, he can turn down those Saudi dollars in the way that the PGA Tour can't. Um, or you can just maybe draw the conclusion that he prefers Miami. He just prefer to go and live there. Who knows? It's maybe fair. we'll find it, out one day. It, it's a very common move that a lot of people are making, even out of New York, even out of California and, and Texas as well. I'll also add the fact that there seems to be this kind of influx into bringing a lot of these very popular sports in Europe to the U.S. I want to say Formula One, for example, also trying to make mm. big bets about getting bigger in the state. So to see that extra backing behind David Beckham now as well in terms of Inter-Miami, yeah. uh, that's enormous for, for the U.S. soccer market. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll watch how this plays out for Inter uh, Miami themselves. Yeah, really fascinating to watch uh, the way that the U.S. game is growing. And David Beckham clearly there and trying to drive uh, some of that on the global stage. So a fascinating story to continue watching. We were just at the Super Return Conference uh, yesterday with Danny Berger. And we'll be there again in moments. Uh, but he, she was talking just yesterday about private equity interest in the space. Plenty of PE money going into uh, sports of all, all varieties we heard in yesterday's conversation. Coming up, we'll talk to Jean Boivin, head of BlackRock. Investment Institute will talk about the rising yield environment. This is Bloomberg. Politics. We're not going to be relying upon countries whose values we don't share. To the world of business. It's all about corporate power in the end. Balance of Power, live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. We're going to be more excited at what's in store for you. How long will it take? How many years? Why don't we take this one day at a time? Good luck. Everybody has a perspective. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, join host Anne-Marie Hordern. It's the one area, really, of bipartisanship. Well, I think we're getting more of it. That's an optimistic. And Joe Matthew. The debt ceiling is looming. How close are we going to get to the line before you start to worry? Alongside Kaylee Lyons. The door was open for regulators to do more. And that puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place. As they deliver news. This is such an important economic issue. He's Last no week. longer trying to run away from that. That really uh, blew some minds. Insight. We can both invest in law enforcement and also make sure that communities feel safe in their own skin. And analysis. I think your audience will get this more than most. This is not the Republican Party that you know. It allows him to do what he did so successfully in 2020 which is run against crazy. From and about politics' biggest power players. This was the zombie case, and it's now more than well alive. That's for sure, uh, with two more potentially to come. I'm willing to have this battle. It is vitally important. This is the intersection of Washington and Wall Street. Bringing people directly to the decision makers right. that impact your investments and your life. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, here's what you need to know. Reality check, global stocks and bonds are just two surprise rate hikes this week, reminding investors that the inflation fight isn't over yet. Wall Street may soon face fresh compliance costs in the U.S. after a reprieve from Europe's tough MIFID II rules, you're expiring next month. 
And a warning from BlackRock Vice Chairman Philip Hildebrand saying investors must reassess their allocations to China amid rising geopolitical tensions with the United States as well as a slowing economy. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, a lot to digest around the world, but for some reason the RBA and the BOC really threw markets for, for a little bit of a loop here. Yeah, absolutely, they did. And what was interesting, when you saw the reaction in the Australian bond market, it was actually more to the Bank of Canada than it had been to their own domestic rate hike story. So that gives you some sense of the way that this story of higher yields has sort of gained momentum as we've gone through the week and uh, been reinforced, perhaps, in investors' minds. This is the stock 600 right now, down a tenth of a percent, a little bit lacklustre. Is that rising yield environment capping our expectations for stocks? Perhaps it is. Certainly capping technology stocks right now. That was the theme on Wall Street yesterday. We saw the Nasdaq down by more than 1.2%. Here in Europe, it's the theme today with technology names under pressure in today's session. Uh, the German two-year yield, just like many of the uh, parts of the sovereign debt curve in the Eurozone, we saw yields rising yesterday on the back of those surprise rate hikes. Uh, but we kind of digested that, and for the moment, just pulling back a little bit, so we're just down a basis point or so on those yields. Still, after the uh, RBA and the BOC at higher levels and rethinking what we expect in terms of uh, the global rate hiking cycle. Wizz Air, this is an aviation business, as the name nicely suggests, here in, uh, well, ba listed in London, uh, based over in Eastern Europe, and we see it is up by 1.7% today after it followed hot on the heels of a host of other aviation names then, Critty, talking positively about the summer that's still to come. Critty? Consumer resilience that is still fueling perhaps those more hawkish bets around the world, and specifically when it translates to the Federal Reserve. I'll get to that in a moment, Anna, but when you're talking about sentiment in terms of today's trade, a lot of that seeping into the U.S. as well. You are seeing futures virtually unchanged right now, 42.74 on those contracts, but a little bit of outperformance in the small caps. And that is a positive sign for the bulls who are saying, look, we're waiting for that breath in the market to show up. Well, you kind of got it. Now the small caps are playing a little bit of catch up to those big, heavier growth things. But again, inflation is the story. Growth is the story. And that's really where those Fed hike bets really matter. The two-year yield at about 455 here. Overnight, though, if you look at the swaps market, they are now pricing in a little bit more hawkishness, something that isn't necessarily showing up on the surface of the bond market just yet. Something to keep in mind, especially as we talk about the ripple effects for the greenback. The Bloomberg dollar index directionally at least following the story of the yield curve uh, down about two tenths of one percent. What's interesting is the weakness in the greenback not necessarily having a positive effect on the commodity market. NYMEX crude still trading with a 72 handle Anna down about four tenths of one percent. Okay, so those are the markets. Let's get to some analysis. Bridgewater Associates founder Ray Dalio says the U.S. is seeing stubbornly high inflation along with elevated real interest rates. He spoke yesterday at the Bloomberg Invest Conference in New York. We are at the beginning of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle debt crisis when the supply demand gap, when you're producing too much debt and you have also a shortage of buyers. Ray Dalio there. Let's get to Jean Boivin, head of BlackRock Investment Institute. He joins me on set here in London. Jean, very nice to have you with me today. Uh, let me start by asking you about this theme that Ray Dalio is talking about there, about levels of debt coming in particular out of, of the United States, but elsewhere, of course. I mean, we're seeing plenty of demand for those T-bills this week, some of those auctions going pretty well, so maybe no lack of demand now. But bigger picture, are you concerned about the potential for a lack of demand as we see governments in Western uh, countries issue so much? I don't think this is uh, the concern of uh, too much demand uh, is, is uh, an issue for the near term. I mean, markets are pretty relaxed about the debt picture. Um, you know, this is one of the things that hasn't, the dog, a dog that hasn't barked is, is record level of debt, and yet, uh, you know, uh, investors are very happy to, um, to uh, get exposed uh, by more of these government debts. We've seen yields, um, you know, falling actually or, or being flat throughout the year despite f central banks raising rates. So I think this, this story is one that is on the radar. I think that's, uh, that, that is something that will be a market driver eventually. Mm. But in the near term, I think this is more of a central bank story and how they're going to play. Right. Play and thinking of that central bank story, we've had a real reminder this week. If, even if you get a pause, even if you get a skip, that doesn't mean you're done with hiking. We got that from the RBA and we got that from the Bank of Canada. Does that have read across? Is the market right to build up expectations of Fed rate hikes in the wake of those moves? Well, for, from our perspective, the biggest disconnect this year uh, was the, the fact that the markets were expecting some uh, quick easing cycle to start, rates to be cut by the Fed, uh, despite the fact that, uh, in our view, we haven't made any progress really on inflation. Core inflation over the last six months have been basically moving sideways at a level that is not 
satisfactory, 5% type. Um, so that disconnect has been now uh, you know, disappearing. We've seen the market in the last few weeks start to move and price out these cuts. I think the Bank of Canada uh, is adding to this, uh, confirming that uh, you know, this is a world where inflation problem is not being resolved yet. It's going to require uh, at least uh, central banks holding steady and keeping rates at uh, the level that they are right now. So the, the high conviction is no cuts anytime soon from our side. Uh, and the risk is to, towards a bit more high, high hikes to come. And I think the Bank of Canada, in this, in this context, a bank that was trying to pause, uh, you know, has really positioned for that and now has kind of been forced to re-engage re in hiking shows that, um, you know, that I do think there's a read across from that. Sean, in addition to kind of the changing narrative around these central banks, as you just pointed out, talk to us a little bit about the liquidity picture here. As we see another big jump in issuance, both from sovereigns and corporates, is there a concern about digestibility in this market? Yeah, I think we are. Um, there's, there is a bigger, um, you know, dynamic at play uh, in the in the in the liquidity uh, banking sector, uh, you know, uh, picture. Uh, we have certainly the debt ceiling, um, you know, being behind us now. We're going to see a lot of uh, issuance coming back to the market. That's going to be happening very quickly, uh, and and will I mean it will be something to watch. Uh, could create some pressure. I think beyond that, we are seeing um, you know a dynamic over the last year since the Fed has started to raise rates that has been pr putting pressure on the banking sector. Uh, we have seen deposits outflows from the sector, uh, you know, in the tune of uh, 800, 900 billion, uh, close to a trillion now. Uh, of deposits outflow from the system, so you get you put these things together, and I think that's a, that's an environment where we are seeing tightening of credit condition, liquidity conditions, uh, and I think that has a, more to play out, and it could come with some uh, volatility along the way as the market digests, uh, you know, these issuance over the next few weeks. What about the pressure theme from China specifically? Is the Chinese read through into some of these Western economies the same as it was, say, 10, 15 years ago? How are you thinking about that side of the world? No, I think this is very different. So, uh, you know, we, we, when you go back over the last 10, 15 years, uh, you were trying to think about China about uh, in terms of how much of, um, you know, a, a cushion you can get from uh, even if we were going into a tougher spot in DM economies, how much of a support cushion you could get from China. I think this is a, this is a very different story now. First of all, I mean, uh, the, the growth dividend from China on the international market, I think, is, uh, is lower than it used to be, uh, given the geopolitics that is happening, the rewiring of globalization that we're going Going through that's certainly one thing, and then and then also I think the the domestic uh, resilience of the Chinese growth is is more at risk now. Uh, you know we used to say the the, the the farther away you're from China, the more bearish you are. I think this environment has been flipped. That uh, has been flipped a little bit. Um, you know, I was in in Asia last week, last two weeks, and um, it's it's a bit the opposite. I think the closer you are to China, the more you feel some uh, concern. Uh, and the Chinese consumer is clearly uh, showing lack of animal spirit at this juncture. So um, these are the big questions. So uh, I think it's very different and uh, less support from the global economy from China, I guess, uh, in this tougher environment is, is for us the, mm, that's the bottom line. Some, some really interesting perspective then on China following your visit. Um, Jean, let me ask you about AI and your expectations. I mean, there's a lot of either hype or excitement, depending on how you see it, and a lot of that increasingly built into stock markets. Do you see this as a technology that could be deflationary? I talked to one guest who, who, who came in from Hedera uh, Federated Hermes who was making that point, saying that this could be something that reduces the way that the, the tight labor market and high wage uh, or rising wage story is filtering through into inflation we might have to wait some time but is that where we're heading so <clears throat> I would start by saying uh, that uh, I think this environment this market environment is one where this is less, less about the macro environment and uh, are we gonna see a recovery recession uh, over the next few uh, few quarters I think it's more about mega forces AI is one of them. I think we're thinking of the climate transition as being another one. Uh, geopolitics, globalization, reward. These are all big forces at play. I think they all have implications for inflation. Um, uh, so, I mean, the globalization reward that we think is inflationary. We're going to see higher cost of production mm. globally. Uh, demographic is, at, at this juncture for us, inflationary. We're seeing a lot of tightness in the labor market because of demographics. AI uh, is, is a third uh, force. Eventually, I think you can tell the story where we're going to get productivity gain. Uh, we're going to be able to produce more efficiently. That could be reducing costs and be, uh, you know, lowering inflation. But uh, before I get convinced on that, it's going to take some time. And I think this is a story for like maybe then five to ten years down the road, as opposed to um, the inflation problem we're facing okay. now. Okay. 
I'll ask you that again then in five or ten years, Jean. Thank <laughs> you very good. much. Thanks for coming in, Jean Boivin of BlackRock Investment Institute. So we thank Jean for joining us today. Coming up, we will be back to the Super Return Conference, our live interview from that conference in Berlin with Joe Taylor, CEO of Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Danny Bergen will be back with that shortly. Plus, we'll have more from the Bloomberg Invest Conference in New York throughout the day, including Critty's panel with executives at Nuveen, Blackstone and Lazard on managing pressure with alternative perspectives. This is Bloomberg. Shaping the C-suite. Bloomberg's chief future officer shines a spotlight on these dynamic leaders. Today's CFO has to be much, much more than a bookkeeper. One of the most important things is looking around the corner. We have to let go of the traditional legacy department store. Their impact goes far beyond the balance sheet. And on chief future officer, they focus on much more than just revenues and margins. You also have to be credible business leaders in order to really impact the business and steer the direction. We are like biologists. We need to deeply understand the financial DNA of a company. People just come with a playbook and say, okay, we're going to roll that. Don't do that. Think longer term. It's an amazing time to be in this role. It's a lot more than the profit today. It's building the future of tomorrow. Get passion, perspective, and more from the chief future officers of some of the world's most influential companies. A new episode every month, only on Bloomberg. A lot's happening on Wall Street. There are so many factors at play today. It remains tight in, in certain parts of the economy. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insight. Crisis is too strong a word, and words like that get used a lot. From businesses most influential and instrumental. America's economy needs a diversity of institutions. That's something that Wall Street pays a lot of attention to. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. most looking forward to my relationships with the founders. I'm really fascinated to hear their backstory. I'm, I'm a storyteller. I, I'm so excited just to have the opportunity to help them win. That was Kim Kardashian presenting her debut private equity fund to a sea of curious investors in Berlin at the Super Return Conference yesterday. Bloomberg's Danny Berger is at the conference and joins us now with CEO of Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, Joe Taylor. Danny, take it away. Okay, that's right. I am here with Joe. Let me tell you, he's just as popular at this conference as Kim Kardashian is. Crowds around him, too. Maybe less security guards, though, Joe. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, look, we, we've talked about this a lot, just Ontario teachers being a different beast. I mean, you're so large, you invest in many different things. You're like a hedge fund. So let's talk about the private equity portion of that. This year and beyond, have you rethought its place in your portfolio? Well, we're very thoughtful about private equity because it's a large part of our portfolio. It's about 60 billion of uh, almost 250 billion of assets at the end of last year, which was our last published numbers. Um, I think the issue for us in private equity is rather than looking at some of the challenges, try and see where we can provide good solutions. So we're talking to private equity firms about helping them with their liquidity. So that's either investing in their funds as an LP or actually trying to help them to sell companies to a responsible owner where we can take it on either with their continued involvement or on our own to the next level as a longer term provider of funding. And, and on the investment side, what type of fund right now do you see that's returning alpha? Who's doing a good job in a difficult environment of still delivering returns? 
Well, I think a lot of private equity firms need to ask themselves, why are they distinctive? It's the same we ask ourselves, what, what sort of brings out the best in, in Ontario teachers within, say, the pension fund community? We would probably say that for us is our agility, as you alluded to a minute ago. So if I go back to your question on private equity firms, I think what we're looking for is somebody who has a dis distinctive investment style, has good returns in terms of proven track record. But I think what the community can really think about is how well do you partner with people? So if you can actually have a trusting working relationship with partners, I think that broadens your opportunity set. And for us, it's all about trust. Yeah. If we can work with people where we think we've got a good dialogue yeah. and we can work together to actually find a better way for the businesses we're both invested in, that's a great result. Now, I know, I know we're here in Berlin, far away from Canada, but Canada has had an interesting week on a macro scale. Bank of Canada, surprise hike yesterday. When it comes to inflation and a peak, a pause, an extended pause in interest rates globally, have we been a little bit too sanguine on the end of rate hikes, the peak of inflation? Well, we said for a little bit we didn't think that the rate hikes were over. So uh, we, we weren't hugely surprised by the Bank of Canada's so 25 basis point lift uh, this week. I, I think it's quite likely to occur again in the US. Um, we're very much in the mode of inflation's going to be stubborn and around for longer. Interest rates, therefore, need to also be high for longer to try and correct some of that. Um, so what we're trying to do with all of that is say, uh, where are the opportunities? Where are the businesses where they have something of a tailwind rather than facing headwinds at the moment because of those two activities? higher interest rates, higher levels of inflation. Are you worried about recession? I think we're anticipating there will be recession. Um, are we worried about it? Well, it will have an impact on some of our companies. We need to help them through that. The beauty about being a long-term patient provider of capital is we can work our way through it. But, it, but of course, it's not just private equity. As I mentioned, you're in so many different asset classes. So how do you protect yourself if there is a recession, if there is a worse downturn? Well, the beauty about being in lots of different asset classes is where some are struggling, others will benefit. So if you look at our approach, we've been relatively creative investing in commodities, investing in alternatives to fixed income, particularly things like infrastructure investing. And our big issue, if we look to our own issues, are, um, you know, inflation is a challenge for a defined benefit pension plan of our scale. So whatever we can do to mitigate the impact of inflation, we'll be pretty actively looking at that. You haven't mentioned public equities. How do you feel about them? How has your exposure to them changed this year? So about 25% of our portfolio is in equities. Uh, the line shares in private equity, about 70% of that number. So our allocation to public equities is already quite light. I think we've seen more recently in terms of the rally in public equities, it's been very concentrated in, again, a few mainly technology stocks. The rest of the market is, I think, not really uh, progressing as strongly as people imagine. Are, are those the, the mega cap tech yes. companies? Okay. Yeah. So the FANG stocks, essentially. Um, and I think for us, what would we say? I think we would say that um, there's probably more risk on the downside than there is opportunity on the upside at the moment. Are we so, like, a, like a correction, a, a further bear market? Well, we've been um, speculating whether it would be a correction really since the fall of last year. So for us, it's a little bit overdue. So why would we think that? We would see risk in the Ukraine, which is still a situation in Europe that's not been resolved. And there are other issues on the horizon. I think food's an interesting one, which could actually be another catalyst for some uh, uh, economic correction. Um, but I think overall, interest rates is probably what's going to drive down com 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 uh, spending from consumers. Right. And, and Joe, you've of course invested through a few cycles yourself. How do you feel about this new generation, which has had to deal with work from home, has had a lot of disruptions, the folks at Ontario Teachers, how do you think about the new generation's ability to deal with this downturn we're in right now? Well, I'm learning, I think it's the honest answer. Um, I, I have to sort of reorientate to try and understand what Generation Z and beyond, and going backwards, are looking for in life. Um, I think they have more flexibility. I think they have more views of what they're looking for in an employer. So we try to portray very much our purpose orientation as an important way of attracting and retaining those people. Are you hiring for me, speaking of which? 
um, let folks go? I, I think we're, we're hiring from everywhere. Um, you know, for us, what we want are both people who are financially literate, but also people who can innovate. Um, and I'd say, it in terms of your, your question, um, to me, the really interesting thing is what younger people want to buy and invest in these days is a little bit difficult. So, different. Sorry. So, you've seen a really big change in, say, travel as a driver of value. So, you know, we own five airports, and actually, it's really been the leisure travel that's driven the recovery more than business travel. Okay. Joe, I'm afraid we're out of time. Really great to catch up with you. I know you're sick of me. We've done a panel. We've done this interview, so I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, Anna, that is Joe Taylor, CEO of Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Danny, thanks very much. Danny Berger joining us there from Super Return over there in Berlin. Now, coming up on the program, can Uber go all electric? We'll bring you our interview with the CEO, Dara Khosrowshahi. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. inside the boardroom. Let's suppose you, you win a proxy fight and or you just get invited onto the board. You go to your first board meeting and you're the person who's saying you can fix this company and all of the others on the board of directors are saying, well, we're doing pretty well. How do you get received when you start saying, here's what I wanted you to do? Well, first of all, we don't bring that to the boardroom. Our time is spent with the CEO, the chairman, the CFO, and share our plans with them outside the boardroom. We try never to solve an issue in a boardroom, okay? It's always be best done the day before, the week before, outside that room. We wouldn't be there if they really were doing well. So it's really hard for them to straight face and tell us we're doing well. Uh, and we present them with the plan. to the world of business. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, hosts Anne-Marie Hordern and Joe Matthew, alongside Kaylee Lines, deliver news, insight, and analysis live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. Get the latest from and about politics' biggest power players at the end of every trading day. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta in New York. Uber wants to cut emissions to zero by converting its entire fleet of cars to electric by 2040. But to do so, the ride-hailing giant will need support from both drivers and riders. The CEO, Dara Khosrowshahi, explains the company's new sustainability features to Bloomberg's Emily Chang. It's pretty significant. Generally, the footprint is based on essentially all the miles driven. We completed 2 billion trips to this last quarter, and we've got to do everything that we can in order to reduce that footprint, and we've committed that by 2030. In the U.S., and Europe, and Canada, we're going to be all electric, and by 2040, we're going to be electric all over the world. That's an ambitious target. Uber wants to cut emissions entirely, so for this ride-hailing giant, that means getting to total electrification, which would be nothing short of a green miracle. It's all part of the company's sustainability agenda, called Go Get Zero. So let's paint the whole picture for me. This whole Go Get 
zero push. What's the goal and how will you get there? The goal is to go electric and create the incentives for drivers to go electric as quickly as possible and riders to pick electric as well. So the smart charging technology is allowing drivers to know when and where to charge, to feel safe to get routes that are efficient. Yeah. Then on the rider side, one new feature that we're introducing is actually a feature for you to see how much you're saving in terms of emissions. Mm -hmm. So when you get that green car or when you get that Comfort Electric, we'll show you how much you're helping out the environment, how many emissions you're saving. We have to get that flywheel together. We need drivers to choose electric, and then we're gonna put more and more electric options in front of consumers as well. How much more does it cost to ride electric? If you're taking green, Actually, it's the same exact price as an UberX. So are it's you a, taking the hit on that, or does the driver take the hit on that? Where does that cost? We take the hit. So okay. we've we've said that we are investing $800 million in the transition to electric, and we've got to make it economically sensible for drivers. So, for example, our take rate on electric rides is lower because right now, generally, EVs cost more than combustion engines. Right. Emily Chang there speaking with Uber CEO about the company's electric future. And we should note, tonight is the premiere of The Circuit with Emily Chang. You can catch that new show every Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Television. A quick check on these markets here. We are seeing futures virtually unchanged. We look at S&P and the NASDAQ. But the Russell 2000, those futures outperform by two-tenths of 1%. 10-year yield, 379. That's it for early edition surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg. It's been volatile. From bank crisis anxiety to AI exuberance, Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow chat with the biggest names about the latest tech trends. Is AI going to dominate the earnings narrative for, for this sector this week? I think we're seeing opportunity and potential platform shift that we haven't seen in a long time. If you're a company today and you're not embracing the changes that are taking place with AI, you're going to be behind. How do you prove to the investor base that you haven't just tacked on AI to make yourself sexy? It's very hard to differentiate if you're not experienced with AI. The startup stories. We think this is a watershed moment for technology. Certain categories are more exciting than others. Right now, obviously, generative AI is a category that is very exciting to startup founders, customers, and venture capitalists as well. So what we are seeing is a new area of opportunities for new founders to come and change the industries that matter. And the real talk on realistic valuations. Some of the best opportunities are, are sitting right in front of us. How do you discern which ones are good on the marketplace right now? I think founders have woken up to the reality that taking on more money at higher terms doesn't necessarily play to their benefit in the long run. How do you actually invest? Follow the VC money on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television.
think that growth is going to slow from here. You have, we believe, a slowdown coming, potentially recession. Inflation, it's coming down, but it's going to remain elevated. The reality is, is there's just a lot less upside left in this rally and potentially meaningful downside. We do think something else will break between now and year end. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Can you sing O Canada? <laughs> Can you sing that? It's a big question. You know the today. lyrics? Yeah, it's no, like, no, Canada. Nice. nice. <laughs> Blame Canada. Blame oh, Canada for the smog. French. Blame Canada for the bond market route. Live from New York City this morning. Good yes. morning. Good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market just about positive on the S&P 500. TK, blame Canada. I think we need to talk about the bond market first. <coughs> blame Canada with a surprise rate hike from the Central Bank of Canada following a surprise rate hike from the Australian Central Bank right. earlier this week. And TK, all of a sudden, the bond market gets a bit more jittery. Central banks like surprise. David Dodge invented this in Canada years ago. Jean Vauvin is expert on this. I believe he was with the network yesterday and the bottom line is surprise always is more efficacious for a central bank than something choreographed out like the idiocy of the dots and the answer is they surprised yesterday and you wonder do we skip pause or do we light a bonfire at the Eccles building June 14th <laughs> what's amazing about this is they communicated a conditional pause back in January and then delivered this line just yesterday that monetary policy was not sufficiently restrictive to bring supply and demand into balance and Lisa there was a question I think a lot of people asked themselves yesterday is that statement in chairman Powell's future exactly what seemed to be sort of implied in the market and if they're sort of committed to a skip what does that mean for the July meeting we now have a full rate hike baked in for July and really this has <clears> been <throat> the past few weeks of pricing out rate cuts and I think that has been the theme it continues to be the theme now yeah. just how high will the Fed you know, what's interesting is some of the Fed speakers in quiet period they're sitting at LaGuardia because they can't get back to <laughs> Washington the situation this morning John is extraordinary and I really want to lead where it's grim Philadelphia sure it is so bad in Philadelphia compared to what we're all living uh, in New York and the ratios of this I have an offspring in China so he taught me how to keep track of this stuff on the, on the, on the iPhone and the answer is it is unmeasurably grim and I don't know when it ends I mean when did the, when did the fires stop in Quebec? A scorched earth I was going through the numbers Bloomberg putting them together Tom 9.4 <coughs> million acres of burnt land in Canada, according to the Canadian National Fire Database. TK, double the size of New Jersey. We're talking about a yeah. lot. A and lot. A lot and far away as well. We don't need to do the weather forecast. Rob Carolyn, who is absolutely giant on this, is scheduled to join us. Uh, he's been just a, a strong supporter of surveillance over the years. But the answer is, like you say, the scale of it. And I don't know, do we say something, the wind shift, the low off Nova Scotia goes away and the wind shifts on Saturday. This is all a distant memory. I don't know. Kind of shocking, yeah. the last 24 hours. Yeah. Let's whip through the price section. <clears throat> Nothing Please. too shocking about that in the equity market. A bit softer yesterday on the S&P 500 this morning. Equity futures slightly positive by 0.05%. If you look at the bond market yesterday, yields adjusted higher. Right now, Lisa, just short of 380. There we go, 380.12 on a US 10-year this morning. And that ratcheting up in yields really seems to be a theme, especially is we are expecting to get more data showing that the economy is resilient. 8.30 a.m. initial jobless claims, they really are still pretty low, even though people are still concerned about recession and some sort of uh, tightening or loosening, I should say, in the labor market. Curious to see whether that changes today. The Bloomberg Invest Conference does continue. Goldman Sachs is John Waldron. Nassim Taleb uh, is going to be joining uh, this one anchor from television. Really He's looking forward to this. He's got a new book on Scott, Scott Patterson wrote this up, and Taleb is on his game in 2023. Very much looking forward to that interview. I believe it's later this morning around 10.30 a.m. My people Eastern. haven't told me yet. It's, Katie it's, Koch, it's, 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 also of TCW, will be speaking. And at 4.30 p.m., I think this is interesting because sort of the backdrop to the pricing out of rate cuts is a banking crisis that's over. That seems to be the theme. So at 4.30 p.m., we get both the Fed balance sheet as well as discount lending outstandings, basically emergency lending programs. Can we count the bank crisis as over yeah. as the Fed's balance sheet? goes back to where it was before the Really crisis. glad you did this, John. This is the heart of the matter. When you talk to all the strategists, they're looking at QT, QE, QTT, QEE is the tipping point of where we go into the third quarter. Alberto Gallo sat in that chair yesterday. <clears throat> yeah. He said if they want to tie to monetary policy, they need to do something about the long yeah. end. Others are talking. Ira Jersey's talking about Others this. talking about Tony it, Tony Dwyer's not talking Tony about Tony Dwyer joins us now, chief market <clears throat> strategist at Canaccord Gemity. Now for 
sure our audience elsewhere, you might think this is going to sound like a bit of a diet, a workout regime, but it's not. It's about markets. Tony, you said light and tight. You want to be light and tight through most of this summer. Just walk me through where you are now, just positioning your approach to this market at the moment. Well, first is, is working for a Canadian company. Don't blame us for everything. Um, <laughs> in addition, it's great to have you, you three back. So, um, so John, it, you know, light and tight basically means keep a little extra cash and be a little bit more on the defensive side. And I, I've been hopefully very clear every time we've been on. I don't think you want to be Armageddon negative, even though economically I still expect a recession. I think, you know, ultimately there's three stages of a market decline. There's first or a market um, scenario when you're in a Fed tightening cycle. First, good news is bad news because it means the Fed's going to get tight. We obviously saw that in 2022. Then you get bad news is good news because that means the Fed's going to be stopping and you get a rally and we saw a couple of those. But ultimately, if you do go into a recession, bad news is bad news. The market goes down and that's when you want to be poised to attack. And right now, I think there's this, this great hope guys, that there's a, a soft landing coming. And, and to me, that's still the worst case scenario. I look, Tony, at the equity markets, and you've been so good about this, saying we're not going to be cautious until we see recession. Do you see recession? And is that the cause for your caution? It, it is, and it has been. So, so guys, I, I constantly hear, all right, smart guy. Well, they don't say smart guy. All right, where is this recession? You've been talking about it for the last six months. <laughs> Ultimately, um, with my friends at Ned Davis, they have a great chart that shows when you look at the six-month to 10-year U.S. Treasury yield curve, which is the widely followed yield curve, historically, there's a lead time from the initial inversion to recession of 11 months. Now, the variability is about eight months to 21 months. The 21 months was before the great financial crisis. So think about that. We're, we're now about nine and a half months into it. So don't you think somewhere around the 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 month mark before the great financial crisis, everybody was saying, OK, where's the recession? You've been talking about it for a while. And eventually it did come. Uh, and, it, and it always is coming from credit. And this time, you know, you did a great job showing the, the QT, the balance sheet. Ultimately, bank failures or the systemic risk in banking wasn't the issue. It comes down to lending. And my issue looking for recession is where is good, you know, where are you going to get the money? If lending standards are tight, if the financial markets are still, you know, mixed at best, especially relative to a year ago, and you're already at full employment, where are you going to get that incremental money to have a sharp growth rate? Right now, people are talking about positioning defensively at a time when recession may be on the table at some point, but it keeps getting pushed out. I keep wondering, what does it mean to be defensive at a time when yesterday you saw bonds sell off and you saw tech sell off because suddenly it was interest rate sensitive again? Right, Lisa. So, so defensive to me is not mega cap tech stocks. Um, it never has been. I, I would not have been, you know, levered long in that space um, with AI. I wouldn't have. I don't. I don't think that for us, most portfolio managers, if you guys have covered uh, a lot, hit, you can't be long just those eight stocks. And up until last Thursday, prior to the payroll report, you had eight of the 11 sectors in the S&P 500 down more than 2% for the year. So sometimes we kind of do this as made for TV, what's your S&P target? But when you talk about a strong market, you have to say, okay, what market are you talking about? If you're talking about the broad market, which, by the way, is having a little bit of a rally, and we wrote a note called the hustle of the Russell um, yesterday, you're getting this a little bit better rally on the hopes that you can avoid a recession. But defensive to me is healthcare, utilities, those, those consumer staples that will typically hold up when you have a top line slow down economically. Tony, how concerned are you that right now you are seeing a growing number of people go into riskier securities, go into the AI story just ahead of something that could be possibly problematic? Do you feel like people are getting lured in just before the kill? <laughs> just before the kill is, uh, I don't know that I'd phrase it that way, Lisa, uh, but yes, the, the answer is yes. You got a VIX at 13. Um, you got people day trading the zero date options. Like, you know, it's the, to me, that's just simply gambling. Um, you've got so many different factors. And, and again, it's this idea of, okay, where's the recession? Maybe we're going to have the soft landing, but ultimately we're, we're doing nothing differently in his, than history. You know, your right. shortest duration between an inversion and a recession is eight months. Um, going back to the 1960s, we're at nine right. and a half, median's 11. Tony, it's TV. What's your target on the S&P? 
you know what, Tom, I stopped doing it. So here's what I'll give you. I'll give you this. The and 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 this goes into kind of the new metric of higher. Tony, it's not a philosophy rates. show. What's your damn target on the S and P? I, I don't. I'm not going to give you one, but oh, I'm going to give you an earnings estimate of two hundred and ten dollars versus the street of two hundred and twenty. So I'm a little bit below the street. Okay. If you look at the current price of the S and P five hundred, it gives you a PE of about twenty and a half. That's too high. Um, when you even look at the earnings yield, it's more like about 5% when you're getting almost 5.34% on the six months. So you don't have to make a big downside bet. You don't have to make a big upside bet. It's a very unclear environment. It's like the, the skyline in New York right now with, the, with wildfires. When you don't need to make a bet, I don't force it because what happens is when I do and it looks wrong, I capitulate too quickly because I don't have a high conviction level in it. I have a high conviction we're going to go into a recession. And when we do, and if the market does respond with bad news becoming bad news, I want to be in a position to attack it, which means a little bit extra cash but not overly defensive, not Armageddon, you know, get only into the defensive. Be tight relative to the benchmarks with a little underweight and mega cap and a little overweight and smaller cap. Came really close to giving us a price target then, TK. He made us do the math. I told you what the multiple should be. You guys are good at math, right? 210 plus, it's got an 11 multiple on it. Tony, thank you. Down to 2400. Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Tony, appreciate it, as always. Don't worry, we are going to talk about this. Messi, we need to talk about this. Not just because I of the said... sport, but also <clears throat> because of the business deals here. Little Messi, arguably one of, if not the greatest football player ever, going down to Miami to play for David Beckham's into Miami. And Tom, the profit-sharing deals that we could see with Adidas and also with Apple. So we've now got this big multi-year deal for the MLS to be okay. streamed on Apple TV, Tom, and there's going to be a profit-sharing deal with Messi and subs, according I, I, to the I, I, Athletic. I, I, That's amazing. A quasi-owner, but basically he's going to a minor league team, right? Yeah, not a great team at all. Okay. And I turning down it. big money to do it. Turning down big money. Couldn't going to have that conversation a little bit later. I'm sure he could. <clears throat> Whether he wants to is a, a different story, Tom. Ed Denny in the next hour. The president of Yardeni Research, constructive on this equity market and why this might be the mother of all mount-ups. The conversation just around the corner. Future's just about unchanged. This is Bloomberg. up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo some 230 square miles of ukraine's southern herzon region is underwater two days after the destruction of the kohovka dam a regional governor says almost a third of the flood zone where thousands are being evacuated is held is held by ukrainian forces while the rest is russian occupied territory now, kiev is assessing the humanitarian economic and ecological damage of the disaster that western leaders denounced as a War crime. Bloomberg has learned a mood of deepening gloom is gripping Russia's elite about prospects for President Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine. Sources say many within the political and business elite are tired of the war and want it to stop, though they doubt Putin will halt the fighting. President Biden has vetoed a bill initiated by congressional Republicans that was designed to repeal the administration's student debt cancellation plan. And Biden's executive action would forgive up to $20,000 in federal student loans for some borrowers. But the battle is far from over as his plan still faces justices in the Supreme Court. And apartments in Manhattan are being snapped up at the fastest pace in nearly a year, just ahead of the busy summer season. Appraiser Miller Samuel and brokerage Douglas Elliman Real Estate say units were listed for an average of 35 days, down from 48 days in April and 52 a year earlier. This despite the higher cost for rent. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
this June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. The top names at the Fed are on Bloomberg. Right now, if you had to tip the scales, the next move is going to be an increase or a cut. It's pretty heavily weighted to the increase for me. Nobody covers the Fed like Bloomberg. What we need to do now is figure out how do we make sure that that relationship is strong to deal with the challenges of the future? I know that's what we're going to be talking about, but particularly strengthening our economies, because that's what it's all about. It's important, you know. What, what was it, uh, like 81 years ago, another prime minister, Winston Churchill, was it, came here, and we'd have to speak in Congress. I think we'll just build on what he talked about, too. Yeah, it's a great foundation for us to cooperate on. So, Thanks. no, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. The British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and the House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in Washington, the Prime Minister visiting Washington, D.C. I understand seeing the President as well. Might build on that a little bit later, or maybe That was McCarthy's not. best meeting yesterday. That was it? That was that it. Was, that yeah, was going to be along on a truly historic fact, day. a little bit contrived house. that, didn't it? You think? <laughs> you think? That odd exchange when between doubt, the two of them. Churchill. Mention Churchill. And just like, <laughs> yes. You know, talk about winking it, right? Ch mention Churchill. I guess we'll just build on that, whatever he said I mean, 81 did, years ago. It did feel like, okay, I say nice thing, you say nice thing. We're doing well right here, yeah? Okay. <laughs> you sort of leaning towards the PRs to scream at, <laughs> yeah. scream at the press to get out. Everyone get out. Clear out, get out. Okay, if you're just tuning in, welcome to the program. Let's whip through the price action on the S&P 500, slightly positive. Lita went through the data for the day ahead. Jobless claims coming up in about two hours and ten minutes' time. Look out for that. So far, the labour market looking okay. Depending on what labour market data you look at, if you look at the payrolls survey out on Friday, things look pretty decent. <coughs> you look at the household survey and the unemployment rate, and things are starting to crack, maybe. Maybe. We'll see what claims bring in a couple of hours' time. Yesterday, yields higher. Today, just a little bit. Back at 380 on a US 10-year. The Bank of Canada with the latest surprise, following the central bank out of Australia with a surprise rate hike this week as well. And Tom, <coughs> just reintroducing some of the risk around next week, maybe. Andrew Hoddenhorst and the team at City, economists there, calling correctly that Canada would hike interest rates yesterday, still calling for a hike of 25 basis points next week from the Fed. They've been dead on, and again, it goes to data dependency. Why are they going to decide now about what they're going to do uh, June, whatever? They're going to wait for the inflation data, wait for other data as well, including, frankly, claims in the dynamics here uh, in two hours' time. CPI Tuesday. <clears throat> CPI That's the next Tuesday. hurdle. Yeah. You're right. And I just think we're data dependent here with futures up three uh, right now. The 10 year yield we're all watching 3.80%. Imagine a 4% 10 year. Right now, on Ukraine, and she has been so, so dead on. Tina Fordham on the tragedy of Ukraine, founder and geopolitical strategist, Fordham Global Insight. Could you imagine a dam breaking and the damage to Kherson and southern Ukraine? Did you see that coming, Tina Fordham? Well, we know that these kinds of tactics are pretty consistent with Russia's uh, kind of scorched earth MO. And in fact, the Ukrainians told us that the Russians had mined the dam. Um, and so we should have been prepared for something like this. Uh, we're in a very critical phase as we are in late spring with Ukraine's uh, offensive much anticipated. They keep denying um, or you know, kind of hushing up when it's happening. This is really consistent with uh, what Clausewitz called the, the fog of war. And, and that's very much where we are at this stage in the conflict. How does this event change, I guess, the state of Ukraine and the war, and particularly the relationship of Ukraine to their allies? 
Well, it's a setback, although, of course, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry and, and President Zelensky are, are soft-peddling that. I mean, Ukrainians' morale remains remarkably high, troop morale and, and citizens. Um, they're evacuating people. They'll deal with the humanitarian consequences. But you've seen, for example, that the water supply uh, from the Kakhova Dam uh, is important, according to the IAEA, for cooling the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, which is something that, that I've been talking about, kind of uh, below threshold actions um, that would uh, constitute a, an escalation. And this is what investors are watching for, of course. Is the war escalating in a meaningful way where there might be spillover? Um, certainly the risk temperature now is much higher, but let's also bear in mind that Ukraine in, its, in terms of its military preparedness, is in a much stronger position than it was this time a year ago. It's got the Leopard tanks, it's got the, the Abrams tanks. Uh, in fact, uh, apparently the first um, NATO supplied tanks seen on the battlefield were, were French. Um, so uh, they are trained now in offensive maneuvers, but the pressure on this, the, the success of this offensive is extremely high. There's no question about it. Um, the patience is, is running out, although the show of strength in terms of support for Ukraine at the G7, it, it remains very high, I think, defying a lot of international observers. Um, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind that everybody wants to see Ukraine um, gain leverage. Tina, a lot of the uh, focus right now is on the alliances, and that's the reason why uh, perhaps some people, not us obviously, are, are focusing on Rishi Sunak down in Washington, D.C. I am wondering <coughs> if you do think that is of interest in any way, that sort of plain vanilla conversation that we just heard of sort of vaguely self-congratulatory uh, back and apart forth. Apart from being so cringy. <laughs> I mean, I, but, was, but just in general, is there anything you're expecting to hear from this uh, confab down in Washington, D.C. with Rishi Sunak? For sure, they'll announce a show of unity and strength on Ukraine, and they will announce plans to continue arming and training Ukraine. That is a given. What Rishi Sunak, the UK Prime Minister, is not going to get is the digital trade deal slash, um, you know, rare minerals, uh, narrow trade deal that he's hoping for. Remember, he's a prime minister of a government that's 20 points behind in the polls. And the UK has elections next year, as well as uh, the United States. Um, so he's a prime minister in a weak position. Um, and the relationship is, frankly, less of a strategic priority for Washington than when the UK was one of the most important uh, members of the European Union and had a lot of other fellow free trade Atlanticist uh, powers standing alongside it. So I think Sunak will be disappointed, but he'll still come away with something to show for his visit to D.C. How does that characterization of the U.K. stand up to the need for U.K. <clears throat> military support in places like Europe, the mainland, and the situation with Ukraine? So this is really important, and I think I wanted to emphasize it for your international audience. Even if there is a Labour government next year, and I, I'm not making that call, despite the you know very pronounced lead in the polls. A lot can happen, as we know. You're not going to see a change away from the UK stance in support of Ukraine. Uh, of, of this, um, we can depend. Tina Fordham, a Fordham Global Foresight. Tina, thank you on the latest, the visit from Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, down in Washington, DC. Got a ton to talk about this morning. Tom, you mentioned we're gonna catch up with the meteorologist a little bit later. <coughs> about the smog, the weather in New York City. Need to catch up on the sport as well, this PGA live tie-up, and this amazing it's deal. It's bigger today than it was yesterday. This amazing yep. deal secured by Lionel Messi and Major League Soccer in the United States. Truly setting some amazing precedents here. Tom, I was trying to describe to you in the commercial break what this could look like in, say, Major League Baseball. Can you imagine, let's say, and I know the network situation and televising Major League Baseball is a mess, mm -hmm. but let's say there was one network and let's say it was, let's say it's ESPN, and ESPN came <clears throat> up with some kind of profit-sharing deal with Aaron Judge, yeah. which essentially was subsidizing the payroll of the New York Yankees. How do you think the other franchises would feel 
about I, that. It's truly really amazing to see something like this develop. Yeah, Craig Moffat and Michael Nathanson, I think, among others, have been way out front on this. And what it is is about desperation. And I think certainly PGA live goes directly into that. It's a desperation here of the old days are over, the captured audience is over, and what do we do? And to do that, you have to co-opt the players, as you mentioned with Mr. Messi. I mean, it's clearly where we're Strider with Pelé well, back in the 70s, Tom, right? What Strider would Tom, with Beckham. Five years ago, what would Brady have negotiated? What, with the network? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, you know, per game fee, profit-taking off. The issue up. is that I think there's a decent argument to make that a player that good with that status just has this transformative impact on a franchise, just the sporting world in this country in a way that a single player in, in baseball or... American football does I, not. I don't know. I just got a message here from Tottenham, and they said, really, you went to Miami. Spurs were in the race. Spurs was on the short list. Yeah, absolutely. Alex Webb's going to join us a little bit later to have a proper conversation about this. I'm looking forward to that. Jeff Hugh of BMY Mellon joining us shortly on the equity market and beyond. Stocks right now, just about positive from New York. This is Bloomberg. the first, you know, call it 18 years at Chipotle, this was, you come into Chipotle along the line, you interact with the crew, and you customize your meal. We've got this separate make line, and it's digitized, and so the orders come in, and they're, they're really kind of staged so that if you say at noon, I want to come in at 1 o'clock, we hold that order, and we will send it to the crew like maybe 10 to 1, right. so it's ready right when you pull up your car. How do you manage these kind of two different staffing needs, right? Yes. And making sure you have the right amount of people yes. at the, at the right, right time. We spend a lot of time uh, projecting sales. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, it's part art, part science. We're trying to bring more science and more AI into it. Because yeah. if you get the right sales projection, then you know exactly what your, sale, what your staffing needs to be. So if you get the sales right, you can get the entire restaurant staffed perfectly with just a couple people. Our, our average restaurant now does about um, over a million dollars per restaurant in digital sales. These CFOs are reshaping the C-suite. Bloomberg's chief future officer shines a spotlight on these dynamic leaders. From the wizards and capitals to new ventures and innovative investment, running a sports empire in Washington, D.C. is a monumental task. Owner Ted Leonsis trusts CFO Peter Bichet to execute monumental sports and entertainment's financial game plan. We are definitely in growth mode. What else can we do? How do we grow the platform? Watch Chief Future Officer, Wednesday on Bloomberg.
lots of messages from East London this morning. Why aren't you talking about West Ham? Well, congratulations, West Ham. I just didn't want to explain to Tom what the Conference League was, and I have no interest spending any time doing that this morning. But congratulations, West Ham. Jeff, you're alongside me laughing because he knows where I'm going with this. I'm not going anywhere with this. Your equity market on the S&P 500.